Do you mind sharing in presenter mode? Thank you so much everyone for joining today. This is our sarcoma patient education and caregiver program. And this is an annual program that we're very excited to provide. And we will go to the next page. Dr. Wagner, who is on here as an associate professor at the Fred Hutch, as well as myself, are co-hosts of this program. And we've tried to compile a very exciting panel of talks to be complementary to previous year's programs to provide an overview on some new and exciting areas within sarcoma that may be of interest. So here is an outline of the agenda today. Things that I would like to draw your attention to is from 1010 to 1020, there will be a break, but feel free since all patients and caregivers are not on video to take a step away whenever you need to and come back. These talks are recorded and will be available to view later if for some reason you're not able to participate or hear every component of the day. As well as at the end of the day, there will be a short question and answer from 1140 to 1150. And then hopefully um, you can resume your day and go on to lunch. Again, this talk will be recorded. Please post your questions using the chat functions. We wanna remind you that the questions will only go to us as speakers and moderators. They will not be visible to all the other patients and caregivers within this um, presentation. If you accidentally leave the Zoom webinar, just go ahead and re-click the link that was sent to you in the event emails, uh, the event email for the details so that you can rejoin. And we would very much appreciate it just so that we can continue to do better and every single year to fill out that event form at the end. And then that way we can um, continue to make this event for you in the future years too. All right, should I go? Ooh, we can at least start sharing your slides. All right, is that the right view? That is perfect. So first, um, I would like to um, introduce Dr. Michael Wagner, who is a medical oncologist and specializes in the treatment of sarcoma at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center. All right, well, thank you very much, Dr. Schaub, and uh, for everyone who is joining in, I hope this is helpful and informative for all of you. Um, my talk is actually very similar to the one that I, or essentially the same as what I gave at the last event with some very minor modifications. Um, but it's just a general overview of sarcoma. So essentially just to sort of set the stage for the rest of the talks. Um, first, I want to thank the groups who are supporting this event. So the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation, of course, is a patient advocacy group that uh, you'll hear a little bit more about uh, in a few hours by Joe McNeil. Um, and the Sarcoma Foundation of America, where we uh, have Karen Cook joining all the way from the East Coast. That's a national sarcoma advocacy group. Uh, we're grateful for their support as well. Uh, and then, of course, the Fred Hutch and University of Washington, uh, where we work and who uh, did the brunt of the work organizing this event, especially um, Ritu Shrian, who you can't see, but I don't want to forget to thank her. Um, so first, I'm going to talk about two general things. So first, what is sarcoma? And then second, in general, how do we sort of treat sarcoma and think about how to treat sarcoma? Uh, but first, starting with what is it? It's actually a cancer that we have proof of existing for a very, very long time. So this picture is actually a fossil of a bone from a turtle that lived approximately 260 million years ago. And unlike most normal bones, you can see that there's this part that is sort of rough appearing. And that is actually 
an osteosarcoma that came up in a turtle. So of course, cancer has existed for a very long time, but just because of the nature of sarcoma, and especially bone sarcomas, we have proof of its existence for you know hundreds of millions of years. Um, and it's named from sort of Greek origin. So sarco means flesh in Greek, and oma is just sort of the suffix that is added on to lots of different uh, types of growth just to indicate that it's an abnormal growth. So uh, just literally sarcoma means flesh growth. Um, collectively, they're actually pretty rare. Um, so each individual sarcoma is a very rare cancer, uh, as you all know. Um, but when you add them all up, they actually account for about, or at least all rare cancers, account for about 25% of all adult cancers. So even though they're rare, um, they're not as rare as a lot of people might think or suggest. Um, in terms of actual numbers, there's about 20,000 people diagnosed with sarcoma in the US every year. And that includes all different types of sarcomas, including ones from the bone, uh, ones in the soft tissue or STS, soft tissue sarcoma, and gastrointestinal stromal tumors or GISTs uh, for short. Um, and they can come up in all sorts of ages. Uh, about 1% of adult cancers are actually sarcomas. Uh, a higher percentage of pediatric cancers are sarcomas. And, uh, you know, we don't have actually a great understanding of why that is, but that uh, just happens to be who gets these uh, sarcomas. And it can come up in any part of the body. So, uh, Things like bone, cartilage, uh, various connective tissues, fat, uh, blood vessels, they can all develop into cancers. And when they do, it's usually some type of sarcoma. And really the origin of sarcomas versus some of the other more common cancer types that you might've heard of, like breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, is sort of where did the cell that the cancer started originate way back to the embryo. So the embryo develops in three different layers uh, in its very early stage, the endoderm, which is the inside one, the ectoderm, which is the outside one, and the mesoderm, which is in the middle. And all of these connective tissues that develop into sarcomas originate in that mesoderm. And that's really the key distinction of why we would call something a sarcoma versus a carcinoma or some of the more common uh, cancers that uh, are just publicized a lot more. It goes all the way back to the embryo. Treatment-wise, the paradigm, or at least the things that we use to treat them are generally the same, um, but there are differences. And in most cases, we don't really know why a sarcoma arises. Uh, for some, we have good ideas. So for example, in GIST, uh, it's very well known that there are certain gene mutations in uh, one of two genes, one called KIT, the other PDGFR, that then make the cell uh, able to grow out of control. Uh, some sarcomas are characterized by specific changes in the chromosomes or in the DNA in the cancer cell itself. Um, so I've listed some of those uh, specifically here, but there's actually many more, especially as we get a uh, better understanding of uh, how we can actually sequence DNA and better technology is now identifying different uh, chromosome fusions or chromosome translocations or other mutations that previously just weren't recognized. So even, for example, Ewing sarcoma is now a whole family of tumors that are actually characterized by different uh, chromosome changes. And we're starting to even think about treating some of them differently. Uh, and then there are some rare genetic syndromes that can uh, predispose people to getting sarcoma. We'll hear more about that this morning by Dr. Dubard Galt, who uh, is uh, the director of our genetics program. And at least one risk factor, so there are several other exposures and um, fairly rare risk factors that people uh, can be predisposed to developing sarcoma if they're exposed to some 
particular carcinogen. Um, but those are especially rare and we don't have very clear associations for most of them. One thing that can predispose people to sarcomas is radiation. Um, so even though it's a very, very rare event, there are so many people who are treated with radiation for other cancers like breast cancer, especially that about one in a thousand people uh, who gets radiation will later in life get a sarcoma that's thought to be from that radiation specifically. Um, what do these things look like? So they have a wide range of appearances. So on the left is a liposarcoma, so a cancer of the fat in someone's abdomen. So um, the way this scan is oriented, so these are two uh, views of the same scan. So on this all the way left picture, that's like we're just looking at someone straight on. So this is just inside their uh, sort of their abdomen or their belly. Um, and this is a side view. So you can see the spine here. And I showed both of these just to give a sense of the size of this, where, I mean, this is literally probably about the size of a watermelon inside someone's abdomen. And these things can develop actually fairly slowly where uh, a lot of times people will just think their waist is getting bigger, they're gaining weight, and they'll try dieting, but then nothing works. And some, in rare cases, it's actually because there's a tumor in there. Um, and then on the right, this is actually an osteosarcoma or a bone sarcoma in someone's knee. And uh, on the left here, so this picture is an x-ray of this patient's knee. And on the right is the MRI. And I put these two next to each other so you can see just the difference in what you can see from the different imaging modalities. So uh, I think a lot of people would actually look at this x-ray and say, well, that just looks like a knee and not even notice anything wrong. Um, a radiologist or an orthopedic surgeon would look at this and say, well, there's actually some uh, sort of weakened looking bone in here along with what looks like a soft tissue mass. Uh, but then on the MRI, it's just much more apparent that there's something there and that uh, you know, that needs to be dealt with. So a little bit more about imaging. Uh, we use various types of imaging just because you get different bits of information depending on what modality you're using. So just to give a very quick overview of what are some of those modalities. So an x-ray, we just looked at, that's one of the quickest ways to especially look at the bones. Um, but with some limitations in terms of the definition, especially of the soft tissue, meaning the muscle structure, the nerves uh, and things like that. Um, so an MRI is very important, especially for looking at sarcomas of the extremities and in the soft tissue of the head and neck and chest wall, um, because it helps us distinguish muscle from fat, especially. Um, and we can get very good measurements of what's the size of the tumor, what's its relation to other important structures. And that, of course, is important if we're planning a surgery or radiation. Uh, most people will also get CAT scans. That's especially important for looking at the lungs. Um, so you can't really see the lungs very well on an MRI. The best way to look at the lungs is with a CAT scan. And because sarcomas, for reasons we don't fully understand, tend to like to go to the lungs if it's going to spread, almost everyone, at least when they're first diagnosed, gets a CAT scan of the lungs. And um, we also use CAT scans as the primary way to look at sarcomas that are in the abdomen or pelvis, depending on where exactly in the pelvis, um, because we get good definition, especially with the in, of the intestines uh, and differentiating all the different organs that are in there from what might be a sarcoma. Um, many people will also get PET CTs or will get PET CTs instead of some of the other ones. And that's useful in just certain circumstances where uh, if we're not sure if something might be abnormal or just a normal variation of, for example, a lymph node, then sometimes a PET CT will really help highlight that. What a PET CT is, is we essentially take a radioactive sugar molecule and inject it into you. Um, it's a low dose of radiation, so not dangerous, but um, anything that's very active or eating a lot of sugar will then take up that uh, contrast dye, and then you can see that light up on a PET-CT, and you, know, you might hear us 
let's say that it looks hot. Um, that means it's sort of orange the way the images are formatted. Um, and then uh, finally, similar to a PET CT, we'll also get bone scans in uh, some patients. That's especially good for looking at bone metastases. Uh, the technology is the same, but it's just a different contrast. Um, so as I mentioned, there are lots of different types of sarcomas. I'm not going to list all of these, um, but I just wanted to give you a sense of really just how many sarcomas are there. And this is just one page from uh, one of the sort of national guidelines for sarcomas showing all the different diagnoses that we treat in our clinic. Um, but this isn't even all of them. So this is just one page of soft tissue sarcomas. There's a whole separate uh, list for bone sarcomas that's just as long, if not longer. Um, so I really just want to highlight how sort of complicated sarcomas are, where you know not all sarcomas are created equal, and they have a very uh, sort of disparate level of aggressiveness. Some are you know, essentially benign, some are very aggressive tumors, and we treat them all differently. Um, and sort of along those lines, I also want to highlight the importance of having an experienced sarcoma pathologist actually look at the tissue and make a diagnosis. And this has actually been studied where uh, a number or large number of sarcomas were reviewed by sarcoma specialists and by just general pathologists. And about a quarter of the time, actually, the less experienced pathologists would misclassify a sarcoma. Sometimes that was a you know, minor difference of, you know, for example, calling one tumor high grade versus intermediate grade, which doesn't make a huge difference in terms of treatment, but sometimes even the entire diagnosis was changed. So about 6% of the time, the sarcoma pathologist actually just completely changed the diagnosis, which of course can have huge consequences in terms of treatment or what might need to be done and even prognosis. Um, so really the bottom line from that is, Really, no matter where you are in the country, it's very important to at least have your tumor evaluated by a sarcoma specialty uh, pathologist. And I think more and more organizations and hospitals are now partnering with academic centers to actually allow for that. But it's something that, uh, you know, unfortunately, still requires a fair bit of patients advocating for themselves. Um, so, of course, all of you. Uh, have already done that just by virtue of being here uh, and being aware. Uh, and just to give a sort of picture example of what the difficulty of diagnosing a sarcoma looks like. And so this is a series of pictures from a paper about GIST, a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And every single one of these is actually a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. If I look at these, I couldn't tell you that. Uh, it just looks like, you know, fields of blue and purple and, you know, like modern art almost. Um, but a pathologist can look at this and they have that experience just by seeing so many of these uh, cases. And you'll see sometimes in your pathology reports that the tumor stains positive for this, this, or that, and negative for other things. And what they actually do when they do that is they use probes that will then turn brown. And if whatever they're probing for is there, then you can actually see that. So in this panel down here, this is actually staining for KIT or KIT in a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. So the normal pattern is actually this bottom left corner where you know, some normal cells should have that uh, protein expressed or present. And so there should be some brown in there, um, but the whole thing shouldn't be brown. And in a tumor, or at least a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, uh, we expect all of the tumor cells to have that. And that's part of how they also make the diagnosis. So uh, next for the last few minutes, I'll sort of speed through, well, how do we treat sarcomas? Um, so there are guidelines, um, so especially uh, in the U.S., we have a panel called the NCCN or the 
National Comprehensive Cancer Network or something like that, I actually forget, but uh, it's a panel of most of the main uh, academic medical centers. We have our own internal representatives who sit on those panels. And in those guidelines, it's recommended that every patient be evaluated in a multidisciplinary sarcoma uh, conversation. And that includes radiologists, pathologists, medical oncologists, surgeons, radiation oncologists. And at least at Fred Hutch, we have a team of people who meets twice a week, uh, once to talk about orthopedic oncology cases or orthopedic sarcomas, and once to talk about uh, other ones, so especially in the abdomen or in the back area called the retroperitoneum. And uh, this is not our whole team, but these are some of the key members of our team. And for the sake of time, I won't introduce everyone, but uh, when we meet in the clinic we and talk about the plan, it's usually a plan that has been discussed or that will be discussed with a whole group. So it's really not just one person coming up with an idea. It's really a group consensus of based on your specific tumor and the size of it and its location and various factors, this is what we think is going to be best for you specifically. Um, Ways we treat it, there are various terms you might have heard. So one is local control, and that really focuses on treating the specific tumor right where it's at. Um, so that generally consists of surgery and uh, sometimes radiation, uh, depending on your specific uh, sort of circumstances. Sometimes we'll use interventional radiology, so things like ablation you, know, you might have heard of. Um, and that's really focused on treating the tumor where it's at, where you can see it. Um, versus systemic therapy, so things that I give, like chemotherapy, uh, a whole host of targeted treatments are more and more becoming available. Uh, and then also immunotherapies are used to treat some sarcomas, and then also especially on clinical trials. Um, the surgery that might be done will depend first on what type of sarcoma is it, where is it, is it on someone's leg uh, or in your abdomen or in your chest or somewhere else. Um, of course, even if we want to do a surgery, if a tumor is in a place that is threatening an important organ that would then need to be removed and we can't remove it, then you know, sometimes we can't do surgery or we'll do other things to try and help facilitate a surgery later on. Um, is there one tumor or are there more than one? Um, and uh, like I was mentioning, what else would need to come out when that cancer is removed? Um, so all of these are things that factor into if and when someone should get a surgery. Um, if it's in the abdomen, then uh, we'll generally recommend surgery. The blood supply also is very important. And uh, I think many people with GIST might recognize this, where just the location of the GIST can actually make a big difference. So um, if a tumor, even if it's small, is in a particular part of the stomach where some of the main blood vessels go, then sometimes really the only curative surgery that's possible is to remove the whole stomach, even if the tumor is actually small. Um, and then uh, I threw this in just because sometimes uh, you might read about this, plus uh, Dr. Mogul, who is uh, on our team now, does HIPEC, which is uh, essentially a way of giving chemotherapy, but directly into the abdomen. Um, so we'll use that in very rare cases for sarcoma. And then also sometimes we'll even do radiation in the middle of an operation. Um, and all of that really just depends on the individual factors that are being faced. Um, just one quick note on people who have sarcomas in the limbs, so arms or legs, the standard is actually to do a limb sparing surgery. So we want to save your arm or leg as much as possible. Sometimes though actually getting an amputation can lead to a better functional outcome than if we did a limb sparing surgery. And that's because there's been really remarkable progress in the past uh, years and few decades with prostheses. Um, so that's always a conversation, of course, to have with your surgeon, um, but uh, something to note. Um, we'll hear a lot more about radiation 
by Dr. Schaub, um, but just the very quick version is radiation can be given either before or after a surgery. It can be used with an intent to actually cure, but it's also very good at just controlling people's pain. Um, and there are a few different types of radiation uh, that Dr. Schaub can explain to you much better than I can. Um, Interventional radiology is something that we'll use. So uh, tumors can be embolized where they literally throw uh, either beads or chemotherapy at a tumor. Sometimes the interventional radiologist can literally freeze a tumor where they'll stick a probe into it and make an ice ball that uh, can freeze the tumor with the goal of killing it. Um, and this is useful in certain circumstances for some types of tumors. So for example, if there's a say three centimeter tumor in the liver and that's the only site of tumor, sometimes an ablation is actually a good way to kill it. Um, and then some people will ask, well, is there anything we can do to prevent a sarcoma from coming back after it's removed? And in most cases, we really will just watch and uh, try and front load most of the treatment. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. And the big one especially would be in people with a high risk GIST or gastrointestinal stromal tumor, where uh, we generally will give a matinib or one of the targeted drugs that targets the specific mutation that causes that uh, type of sarcoma and give that after a surgery. Um, we'll sometimes use chemotherapy or radiation. Radiation much more commonly, I would say, than chemotherapy after a surgery. Um, but uh, a lot of people will come in and ask, are there any specific diets? Are there any supplements that I should be on? And the real answer is no. Um, in spite of what is you know, widely available on the internet where you, know, you can basically find anything you want and uh, find someone trying to prove one diet or one supplement over another. Um, but really what I tell everyone is, you know, that still doesn't mean you can just, you know, go and eat a tub of lard for dinner. It's, that's not good for you. Um, you still want to maintain a healthy diet and you know, staying as active as possible, of course, is good. That's true whether you have cancer or not, but it's definitely true even if you have a sarcoma and you're going through treatment and then after you've finished treatment. Um, for chemotherapy, um, there are certain subtypes where chemotherapy is needed, especially if the sarcoma has spread and surgery or radiation aren't really options for cur curing the disease. Um, there are a number of chemotherapies that we use now. I've listed a few of them there. Uh, we'll also use targeted therapies um, and we'll do that if we know that there's a particular mutation in your tumor. Just again is the sort of key example of that where imatinib is really the one of the most effective cancer drugs that really was groundbreaking when it was first developed or first uh, discovered about 20 years ago. Um, Pazopinib or Votriant is another drug that has now been approved for sarcomas. That's a more targeted drug compared to just the IV chemotherapies. Um, we'll use immunotherapies, uh, usually off-label. Um, I'll show you in a second that there was actually just an immunotherapy approved for a very specific rare type of sarcoma called ASPS. And then of course, clinical trials where um, that's, I think one of the benefits of being at a place like Fred Hutch is uh, we generally will have some clinical trials available. So usually about a dozen to 15 clinical trials at any given time, and they kind of come and go. And uh, once one trial fills up, usually there's other ones to take its place. Um, but that's really how we make progress is by doing these studies to test new drugs and you know, hopefully find uh, better ways to treat sarcomas than what existed in the past. Um, just to finish out and show some progress that's happened in the past few years. So there have been a number of drugs approved for sarcomas in just the past decade or so. So trabectidin was approved for lyomyosarcoma and liposarcoma. Aribulin is another chemotherapy now used to treat liposarcoma. Uh, Pazopinib, I mentioned before, that's been approved just within the past 10 years or so. Uh, very recently, a drug called tazimidostat was approved for a rare type of sarcoma called epithelioid sarcoma. 
Paxidartinib is another drug that's a targeted drug that treats tenosynovial giant cell tumor. Um, so uh, even in the past year, a few other ones, so nabrapamycin uh, has recently been approved for a particularly rare type of sarcoma called picoma. And then uh, I mentioned atezolizumab, which is an immunotherapy, and that's actually the first immunotherapy approved by the FDA for a sarcoma, and it's approved for alveolar soft part sarcoma. Um, so really, I just wanted to highlight that there are many clinical trials underway. Um, and that's really what led to all of these drug approvals. Uh, and as you see from this list, the approvals in the studies are becoming more and more subtype specific. So rather than lumping all sarcomas together, now we think of each one individually actually as a different disease. And we try and design our treatments to be better targeted for that specific subtype based on the mutations that uh, tend to associate with that subtype and just how they behave. Um, so just to conclude, sarcomas are a rare group of cancers uh, that require specialized multidisciplinary care. And even though we've made many advances, as you saw just in the last two slides, with all of those drugs being improved in the past decade, uh, there's a lot more work to be done. and um, we uh, hope that the coming years will have even more drug approvals and we will help people live better lives with sarcoma or without, ideally. So thank you very much. Um, and I believe Dr. Schaub is presenting next. So uh, she has already sort of been introduced and introduced herself, but Dr. Schaub is one of our radiation oncologists who is also co-chairing this meeting with me. And uh, she will talk about radiotherapy for sarcomas. Perfect, thank you so much for joining today again. And Dr. Wagner and I will be on at the end during the Q&A, so we can also add, address more questions at that time too. So my talk is about precision radiotherapy for sarcoma. So here's an outline of what we'll be covering in our 20 minute talk today. So an introduction to radiation therapy. Many of you, and I see some um, friendly names in the audience, um, have experienced radiation therapy personally, or, or a loved one may have as well. But for those that may have not had any prior exposure to radiation therapy, typically what we're talking about when we mention radiation therapy is called external beam radiation therapy. It is delivered by a treatment machine that can deliver high energy X-rays called photons or charged particles called protons. Typically patients see nothing, hear nothing, feel nothing, and you're no harm to others. You're not radioactive with these forms of therapy. Radiation is only on typically for a few minutes and you're in exact treatment position within millimeters of accuracy during this treatment. You're no different from when you entered and left our building. It's an outpatient treatment and side effects tend to gradually accumulate over the course of therapy, peaking typically about a week after therapy completion. When is radiation therapy typically recommended? Building upon Dr. Wagner's comment about when, we, when a patient's tumor is localized, we often use radiation therapy for soft tissue sarcomas, especially when they're intermediate or high grade, meaning under the microscope, they have more biologically aggressive features, or if they're larger sizes, such as about five centimeters, and select low grade tumors. Typically, we do radiation before surgery, but on occasion, we will do radiation after surgery instead. And most often, we do this when tumors are located in the extremity, somewhere in the arm or leg, or somewhere on the torso trunk. In select cases, we often um, we consider radiation therapy for retroperitoneal sarcomas, which are tumors within the abdomen region or the belly. And this is typically for certain types of sarcomas within this region where radiation therapy has been shown to be effective at reducing the risk of it coming back, or when surgery anticipates that there may be very close surgical margins, meaning concern that they might have a risk of leaving microscopic tumor cells left behind, 
or potentially what we call planned positive margins, meaning we want to give radiation therapy for an added insurance policy on that critical blood vessel or nerve or bone. The other time in which we often use radiation therapy is when tumor has, tumors have spread to other parts in the body. There are different scenarios in which we may think of using radiation. The first is what we call oligometastatic disease. This derives from the Latin word oligo, meaning few. The definition of this ranges in the literature, somewhere typically between three to five areas that the tumor has spread to, where either surgery or radiation as a local control, and sometimes like Dr. Wagner pointed out, you know, we have excellent interventional radiologists that might do cryotherapy or other procedures too. Um, we're essentially treating this locally with some sort of ablative type of procedure may be technically feasible. The other time in which we may think of this is oligoprogressive disease, when a patient may have tumors in many different spots of the body, but they may be responding really well to their medicine-based therapy that goes everywhere in the body, but maybe one, two, or three areas are starting to develop resistance to that therapy and growing while everything else is still responding really well. Those are situations where we might consider coming in with radiation therapy and or surgery to kind of spot treat areas that seem to be more refractory while allowing a patient to go on and continue that therapy that seems to be working and well tolerated everywhere else to be able to enjoy that therapy as long as one can. The other situation in which we often think of using radiation is for palliation, really to help with pain, to help with improving symptoms that a patient may be experiencing. Or sometimes even if a patient is not experiencing pain, really think of, thinking about if a tumor were to grow in that area even a little bit, would that really result in a potential effect that might impact quality of life? Like if a tumor were near a spinal cord, if that grew just a little bit, would that impact the ability to walk? And we really want to be thoughtful about intervening early to minimize that impact down the road. There are different types of external beam radiation. I think that this is an overview within a short period of time. What I can say is one of the nice parts about practicing here and meeting either myself or Dr. Ed Kim, who is the other sarcoma radiation oncologist, is we really have the opportunity to have just about every tool or technique under you know, a few roofs, but under University of Washington system um, to be able to try to figure out what type of radiation or what type of combinations we think might be best um, in partnership with each patient. X-ray-based radiation is the more traditional type of radiation. We do have a proton radiation therapy facility here too, which is the only one within the Northwest. And the ne next com um, most common located one is Utah and Southern California. And so protons, so X-ray radiation or sometimes called conventional radiation, if you see the tumor here within a brain and you think of radiation as a flashlight shining a radiation beam, you can come up with a really nice radiation plan by coming in with different angles and increasing a dose of radiation, spreading out the low dose so that you can essentially have the high dose in the area that you wanna treat to deliver an effective dose that you think will help control the tumor in that area. However, with x-rays, there is an exit dose. With proton radiation, you typically come in with one, two, or three beams and you still have the entry dose of radiation and you treat the tumor you want to treat and a normal rim of tissue beyond it for microscopic extension of disease, as well as potentially small millimeters of set of differences on a daily basis. And so that can be advantageous for tumors in certain locations. And we'll highlight a few of those different locations since this tends to come up in a lot of patient questions as we're meeting patients for the first time. So another way, um, not that I'm asking any of you to learn physics, that we think about the two different types of radiation is if you look here of, on the x-axis of going deeper into the patient's body and on the y-axis, the dose of radiation, you see here with an x-ray um, radiation beam, you have a dose buildup to a certain depth and then you have an exponential dose fall off. 
for that radiation. With proton radiation therapy, you have an entry dose of radiation. It builds up, it treats the tumor that you wanna treat, and then you have no exit dose. The challenge is an analogy I give a lot of patients is it is somewhat like driving and seeing a stoplight turning red and you hit the brakes and there's still that stopping power slowing down of that proton particle. And so there is still some dose beyond what you're treating, but less. But that is sometimes why there are subtle considerations on why it might seem on paper that protons might be better, but we might kind of guide a patient um, one, one direction or another. These are some clinical scenarios in which we often tend to favor proton radiation therapy. One is re-irradiation. This is when a patient, for example, a patient that may have had a tumor caused by radiation in the first place, or a patient that has previously received radiation for their known sarcoma, to be able to better limit that lack, to be able to better harness that lack of exit dose, to allow us to safely treat and limit those regions of overlap with prior areas of radiation therapy. Sometimes in the setting, we Essentially, we call it dose painting, but we give lower doses to areas to a safe level that we think as we add up the different doses over time, and we're able to give higher doses to areas that are further and further away from the pre prior radiation field. Other situations are head and neck and sinus sarcomas. These tend to be um, thought of most commonly when we're only needing to treat one side of the head and neck region, such as one side of the neck or a parotid gland or a sinus tumor that might be really near the nearby eye and, uh, and nerves that supply the, the vision of the eye, as well as the underlying brain. Other situations in which we think of proton therapy are for thoracic tumors. And this is often, again, in situations where a tumor might be more located toward one side of the body. And so we're really harnessing that lack of exit dose for proton therapy to limit essentially the radiation dose to the heart for this patient. This is kind of a cross section through the body at the level of the heart where this is the, where there was a right lung and this is the remaining um, isolated left lung. And radiation therapy to that whole right lung cavity was able to help reduce with proton therapy that radiation dose to the um, heart, as well as we were able to almost keep no radiation dose at all to that left lung to minimize the effect of radiation-induced lung injury as low as possible. Sometimes we do consider it for very lateralized, so tumors off to one side in the retroperitoneum. Again, we're kind of going down in the body. So this is in the belly area. This is a patient standing. Here you can see the bases of the lung on the right and the left side. Here's a kidney on the right side, and here's a kidney on the left side. And this is a large abdominal retroperitoneal tumor where we were able to deliver proton radiation therapy, knowing at the time of the surgery, like Dr. Wagner had mentioned, there are times where other things have to come out with the surgery, and this patient had to have a kidney removed. And so we really wanted to be thoughtful about the remaining um, kidney function on the other side to make sure we limited the effect in the long run of that patient having any kidney injury, and we used protons to help with this. The other situation, especially when we treat patients in our pediatric as well as young adult patient population, is to limit radiation dose for fertility. Here is a patient that we treated with a sarcoma within the groin, and here we had um, really low scattered doses of radiation can render um, both uterine, our ovaries and testicles infertile from radiation therapy. And so here we were able to harness that lack of exodose of proton therapy and help minimize and keep the risk of infertility extremely low from radiation therapy. And same with here is a female patient where the proton radiation therapy to a tumor located on her back was able to keep um, the ovary doses low and within our um, sarcoma group, we have a cohort about, of about five or six patients that have actually gone on to conceive um, children help, um, without even the need of advanced reproductive assistance to um, after radiation therapy when using these highly precise radiation techniques and really partnering ahead of time about a patient's goals. 
The last, uh, the last scenario that we often use proton therapy are for spine tumors. These are the really re re um, resistant tumors to radiation that require us to really deliver quite high doses of radiation therapy right near very critical areas such as the spinal cord or nearby kidneys or bowel that often have much lower doses of radiation that they can tolerate. And so these are the chordoma and chondrosarcoma tumors typically. Proton radiation therapy can come in with usually just a couple radiation beams from behind. And if you see here, this is a very low radiation dose line. Like if you think of a topographic hiking map and here you can see, see essentially, we have no exit dose of radiation beyond the area that we need to treat with radiation therapy. And that helps us deliver this safely. Why not use proton radiation for every patient though? One, urgency. A simple x-ray plan can be generated in hours to days as opposed to weeks with proton radiation therapy. Two, no critical organ that can be better spared with protons. This is often the case for extremity sarcomas. And the reason why we think of this is when, when we're doing um, radiation therapy for sarcomas within the leg or arm, one of the side effects that is at the top of our mind is that risk of healing at the time of surgery, that radiation can increase. And if we increase the skin dose with proton therapy, because we're only coming in with a couple radiation beams, that actually potentially could worsen that side effect. And if we're not really having a meaningful benefit in sparing something like the testicles or some other part in the body that might make sense in the long run of accepting the slightly higher skin toxicity and wound healing complication rate. I often do favor x-ray based radiation that can help us keep that skin dose down as much as possible. Other things, logistics, travel, and insurance. Protons is unfortunately a more expensive type and limited resource that we have available. And sometimes insurance companies can take some time to be able to fully um, comprehend medical necessity, even for things like fertility, among other things. But we always partner to try to figure out what makes sense and making sure that we help offset this as much as possible. Hardware. Protons are particles that can deflect like a bowling ball um, on um, bumpers for titanium hardware, unlike x-ray based radiation that can kind of flow through it much more fluidly. So for patients that have significant hardware, hip prostheses, um, spinal hardware, other things right in the area that we have to treat, we have significant concerns that while we can create a radiation plan on paper, the delivery of that plan may under or overdose areas that we don't want, and we want to be as safe as possible. And so those are areas that we often do favor x-ray based therapy. There are advances in our spinal hardware that often we partner with our um, both orthopedic, but um, spine surgeons, particularly in a treatment of spine sarcomas and sarcomas that have spread to the spine to often consider putting in these carbon fiber special implants that keep these things possible. And dose distribution. One thing I wanna point out is if you noticed, almost every single picture I showed you was with a tumor that was on the bigger end. And so for things that tend to be smaller and we often have other size, types of precise techniques, such as SBRT or stereotactic body radiation therapy that can deliver very focused, extremely high doses in a very short treatment length of time, such as three to five treatments. And this can be essentially like doing surgery to that area. And those are times that we actually really do favor this other type of technique. And here we come in with little x-ray beamlets all the way from a 360 de degree axis often to deliver very high doses to the area we want to treat. This is a patient with a lung cancer or sarcoma that had spread to the lung and it was an isolated lesion that was actually growing despite therapy responding everywhere else in the patient. And so we treated that base of the right lung with this SBRT technique. Um, that was five total treatments. This patient held their breath um, during the delivery of the radiation, but we have other techniques too to minimize that lung tumor moving during the treat during the tight de delivery of radiation. And we know that 
This technique for small lung metastases can result in long-term durable control for that specific tumor greater than 95%, especially when they're in favorable locations right near, not near the center of, um, of the lung area. We also know that when sarcomas have spread to the spine, especially only in a few different few areas, we can harness the same technique to deliver very high doses um, to the spine itself, which you can see the bones of the spine here, while trying to limit the dose to the spinal cord that was drawn here to be able to keep the delivery of this as safe as possible. A physician for these treatments actually verifies each daily treatment because of those high doses before it is actually delivered. And so that is kind of my overview of a few different exciting areas that we think of radiation therapy for sarcoma. But I'm happy to answer any questions um, later in the day too. And I can um, take the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, um, Dr. Marianne dubald galt who um, is going to be talking about genetic predispositions to sarcomas. All right. Let me, can you hear me okay? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. All right. So let me share my screen. You see, oops, you see the. It's the just hereditary genetic testing for patients with sarcoma. Absolutely, we don't see it in presentation mode yet, but it looks perfect. How about that better? Yes, it looks perfect. Thank you. We just lost it. I, yeah, I was going to say, I, before I go into this, I'm just going to, going to share with you that I'm getting a message that the Zoom will quit. <laughs> oh, no. Well, so I guess maybe, we can just go and... Yes, let me uh, maybe turn my video off because then the feed will be um, uh, uh, for the, the sound uh, only. And so maybe that will make a difference. Do you, you want to try that? Yeah, that sounds good. And do you still see, uh, uh, Michael, do you still see the hereditary genetic testing for patients with sarcoma? No, we don't. I think we lost the slides. All right, so let me bring them back. Exit this. Let's try again. And if for some reason that the Zoom quits and we need to reload, what we can do is we can always shift our break, which is right afterwards for 10 minutes, um, to during that break while you're getting back on. And then we can um, just resume right after that. Absolutely. Oh, yes, it, it does seem to be quitting still, but it probably will happen again. And I am at work today. How about now? Is this, do you guys still see the, the presenter slides? Heritage genetic testing? Yes. So I can go ahead. We'll see. <laughs> let's let's try this. And and this will be a, a shorter presentation because um, of what you've just heard already regarding the treatment with certain chemotherapies or certain targeted therapies and radiation therapy for sarcoma. So I really want to focus our conversations today on the genetic part of things where uh, really what I would like to touch on is uh, what is genetics and how to get genetic testing, the different types of genetic testing that are available, uh, genetic testing for sarcoma specifically, uh, and there is probably a lot more that we need to learn about this, and then the results and significance of testing uh, for sarcoma. All right, so um, before we go into any of the other things uh, for the genetic testing, I want to highlight the picture here of the times that the genetics uh, field is really the study of 
the DNA or how do we interpret or use the DNA that we have in our body to inform what it means and to inform what it means for the cancer uh, diagnosis or the treatment. And as you see the different um, arrows pointing to uh, the doctor looking at DNA and uh, it coming from the many different types of tissues, this is really what we are talking about. And then for the little family at the bottom is really how do we then look at the patient, uh, not only the patient themselves, but the patient around with their family members, because it may very well have implications for the whole family. All right, and so if we dive into this a little bit further, what is a genetic test? Um, and the genetic test is really the study of the DNA. So if you see the person here, we, we go all the way sometimes to getting a sample from a, a retroperitoneal sarcoma or some uh, an abdominal sarcoma, for example, and we go all the way uh, looking inside the cells to remove the DNA from it. And the DNA is really this, uh, uh, comes from the chromosomes and the string of letters that um, is the code of how we are built uh, and all, all of how organs are, are working. And so this string of letters or code helps um, us identify a specific change or something in the uh, letters to inform a mutation or something like that. Right. Next. All right, so, and then how can we tell the difference between what uh, the genetic uh, test tells us between a, a mutation that is the a mutation of cells that is part of the cancer? So there is a, a damage in the cell that is uh, from a mutation of the DNA, and that is why we always think of cancer being a genetic disease. Uh, but the difference being that you can have very many uh, uh, mutations uh, uh, going through different layers and different progressions of the disease, and, and meaning that not all those mutations are going to be something inherited in the person who was, you know, um, uh, born that way. And so not all cancers are created equal or hereditary, if you will. So they're genetic all the time. They are driven by mutations, but are not always uh, inherited. And then so then there are many different types of genetic testing. And so the lab will perform um, uh, genetic testing on blood, on saliva, on tumor uh, tissue. So we'll scrape the tumor off of the slides that Dr. Wagner just shared with you or showed you and be able to test the, the, tum the genetic mutations in the sample of the, the sarcoma, for example, or spitting in a cup or doing a blood sample would work as well. And then there are also options to do liquid biopsies these days where you can actually extract the DNA that are circulating in the blood from the plasma of the patient. And so not all genetic testing are created equal either. There are, as we talked about, the germline or a hereditary kind of genetic testing, and you'll hear those words used interchangeably. Uh, and that is really for identifying an inherited risk of cancer in a person or their family. Uh, there is the genomic, tumor, somatic, all of these words almost uh, look at the same thing. They look at the DNA in the tumor, and that is for people who have a cancer diagnosis or sarcoma. And the testing then will be called the biomarker type testing, and that is to help make treatment decisions for uh, the cancer uh, treatment. And then right in between the two, and that this is where we interact together with uh, many different uh, group, uh, doctors in the sarcoma a group where we help use this information to inform the decisions for the treatment and then refer for genetic counseling to talk a little bit more about the implications of the results and what to do about it for the patient and the family. And this is also then to help inform whether there are other things to think about for the future or other people in the family that would need uh, different interventions or screenings or other things like that. And, and really, this is where it, it matters we find uh, the genetic information. So if we find the genetic information or the results in the blood of a patient or the saliva, or when we look at the genetic makeup of the person, uh, we are thinking about the genetic changes that are inherited or that would be passed on or passed down to uh, a progeny or the same if it was passed down from the generation before to uh, our siblings equally or other sides, uh, other members of the family on one or the other side. And sometimes when a tumor is in the the, the, the mutation is in the tumor alone, it means that it's only specifically related to getting this cancer there in the first place, but not something that was part of uh, the person to begin with. 
uh, how to get genetic testing to be able to do all of these particular or different types of te testing is with your oncology doctor, like Dr. Wagner and others, where they could order the biomarker testing and then help guide the treatment decisions and then refer you to a genetics doctor like me or my team of genetic counselors to decide what the, these results mean for uh, the future or for the family. Uh, you could meet directly with a genetic counselor, either uh, with a self-referral or a referral from your oncology or your primary doctor. And then that is the time where the genetic counselor will review your family story and then help inform which kind of testing we would do. And also I put this uh, handle there because a lot of places uh, in the country do not have uh, enough genetic counselors. And so this is the National Society of Genetic Counseling. Uh, they put a website uh, together uh, and they called it findageneticcounselor.com to really, really help um, identify someone who could help in your area. And we are very lucky in the state of Washington, we have many, many amazing genetic counselors and genetic doctors. All right, uh, an important thought, thought for the genetic testing because Today for sarcoma, uh, genetic testing is not always covered. Uh, it is most often covered when you have a family history of cancer or when you have a specific kind of cancer where we know there is a genetic predisposition attached to that cancer or when there is a known mutation in the family where we already had genetic testing before a person was diagnosed with sarcoma. And this information can then be used to say, yes, this person needs testing because it can inform their own treatment and or um, their um, uh, family uh, um, uh, implications. And then something that comes up very often in our conversations in genetics is, are my genetic results safe and private? And the answer is absolutely yes. The genetic results that are obtained medically, so in healthcare for your, um, for your treatment plan and your care is protected under this patient-doctor relationship that is confidential with HIPAA. And there's an additional law protecting um, this information called GINA, and that stands for Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And that is specifically to say that no one outside of healthcare providers or whoever you decide this information should share, be shared with can access uh, this uh, particular type of results to inform whether they would give you health insurance or other things like that. All right, so a little bit more about the, the different um, uh, genetic uh, mutations or things we think of for people who have a sarcoma. And I think the main message before I share anything else is that today we do not have the full picture of what the genetic markers are for sarcoma because we've only started testing people who have a sarcoma more recently. And this is something that we don't have the full answers today. So even if Dr. Wagner, Dr. Schaub, or other doctors would order the best test on the market, it may not uh, give uh, all the answers today. And I put the reference at the bottom here for you to really see that the most uh, um, the most recent uh, report that we have on, on genetic testing for sarcoma is from this year. So we're learning a lot more things as we go forward and I anticipate we'll, we'll have a, more, a lot more uh, genetic results to share or to repeat in the future. All right, so this study that I wanna share, I wanna only pick one because um, I also wanna uh, highlight a few thoughts from this study. Uh, the one study that was done this, this year um, was for 1600 patients with sarcoma and the people were in France and Australia. And they found uh, uh, a genetic predisposition for patients with a sarcoma in five to 10% of the patient. I'll show you the number in a second. But you see here the list, and you don't have to read all the list of those sarcomas, but you see the breakdown of the different types of sarcoma. And I think that's a point that is very important because genetically, probably not all sarcomas are created equal either. And so we may not need to, or we should probably not lump all, all the sarcomas together and, and tailor the genetic testing based on the type of sarcoma or the family history or a combination of both of these things. And so the main message here was that this particular group did research kind of genetic testing, not clinical type of genetic testing, and they found more than 59 genes attached with an increased risk of sarcoma or a sarcoma diagnosis. And they identified one of these genetic mutation in 109 patients out of the, the 16, 1644 patients, so for 6.6%. A positive rate of a person being diagnosed with a genetic predisposition to sarcoma. And I think the last thing that was really important for me in that paper or that report was that not always did the diagnosis of the person match the gene or what we anticipated would be the case if they were to have 
this genetic predisposition. And this to me highlights the things we don't know today and the things that are really important to keep in mind, not only for targeted therapy, but for us to be able to test maybe more people with sarcoma because we don't know all the answers. So the main message I would share uh, is really to take it uh, on and to do go to genetics because this information could have uh, implications and help your doctors uh, forward. All right, so today the genes that we can test for clinically, so not under research, but the, the testing that a, a genetic counselor would do with you is the gene TP53, and that is associated with different types of sarcoma, RB1, that also is associated with different types of sarcoma, P10, and that's a gene that's associated with rhabdomyosarcoma and many other things like little uh, moles on the skin or a larger head or things like that. Um, NF1 that is associated with little fibromas on the skin and many other things as well. Uh, and DISO1 is another gene that is associated with rhabdomyosarcoma. I will not go into the list of all of these genes and tell you a little bit more about what they are attached with uh, because there are really, really many, many more. And that is, this is also why meeting with a genetics uh, person and talking through the different options and, and uh, opting for a, a test that is much broader or larger is probably a good idea because as we learn more, uh, this information will be useful for, for GIST tumors, for example, to inform treatments or for other things. All right, and I just wanna share briefly a little bit on the implications for the family because sometimes when you test genetically one person, you've tested more than one person by proxy, especially if there's a strong family history of cancer in the family. So if you look here where I put the arrow, um, this particular uh, child had a soft tissue sarcoma at the age of seven. And, and you could, uh, if you were to have tested this child as the first person to have genetic testing, you could then probably link this genetic uh, test result uh, for this uh, child with sarcoma here with the mother of the child who had breast cancer at age 35. And then probably also if you go one generation further with the grandfather here and the grandfather's sister over here, uh, who had a breast cancer and an osteosarcoma, you've also probably genetically tested that side of the family saying you could probably think this genetic predisposition was inherited from this side of the family, okay? So by testing one person, it matters for not only for maybe doing screening that is different for breast cancer screening in the future or doing different screening for mother uh, going forward and or doing different kinds of screening for other relatives who probably would have never known they were at risk of a cancer um, uh, uh, and didn't have the cancer at the time. So really, this is something that we do in genetics that is a little different than in oncology, where we think about the person and the family all together as one unit to inform what we do for screening. And then the, tech, the take home points today are that as far as we know today, five to 10% of patients with a sarcoma have an inherited or hereditary cancer risk uh, or a genetic mutation that puts them at risk of a cancer in the future, um, the medical oncology doctor or team can order biomarker testing to help identify treatment options. And that is often one way you can uncover or discover an inherited genetic mutation that informs uh, why the cancer was there in the first place and what to do about it. And that often will lead to a referral to a genetic counselor um, and really, genetic counselors are absolutely amazing. They're here to help. Uh, they help patient and families do this family tree that I showed you and really inform which type of genetic testing we should order, how much genetic testing we should go for, whether you'd like to go for the genetic testing or not is your choice, but having the options and then helping you through the different steps of getting the genetic testing done and reviewing the results to inform what they mean for your treatment and for the future. Uh, and again, this, as we shared uh, uh, briefly a little bit, the genetic testing really is for the family as a unit, and it helps organize screening for people who are not really qualifying for screening for something else, for activeness, for other things to reduce their risk or remove a, a part of their body, like breast, the breast issue, if they need to, for example, to really get their risk of cancer down to as low as possible, and prevention strategies for um, inherited cancer risk in the future. And on that, I will share, this is my wonderful team of genetic counselors. We are, uh, we are very happy to meet with you guys and talk a little bit more about this in more details. I opened up a lot uh, today uh, in, in this area, but this is something we can definitely go back and sit down and talk about more. And the genetic 
uh, clinic has the phone number that I put down there for you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to, I think we have a few moments for a couple questions. If anyone wants to put a question into the chat, again, it'll um, show up for the panelist and we'll repeat the question. I'm going to stay mute, uh, on the uh, off video just because it my video doesn't doesn't like it quits it quits the Zoom. <laughs> I'll give it another minute. I have a quick question, and um, can you speak a little bit more toward how um, how you think about the timing of the genetics um, evaluation in regard to if it's needed for an active therapy decision, such as can we avoid radiation therapy if a patient has a known genetic mutation versus if it's something that may, may inform future surveillance down the road for other types of cancers? Absolutely. And so I think about it based on the diagnosis of the patient, so the actual specific um, sarcoma, and then the family history, whether there is something highlighting a strong family history of cancer that would be pointing us in one direction or another, that's very useful. Um, and that is when maybe the genetic testing could be done a little sooner, so it helps inform uh, whether we would do radiation therapy with x-ray versus protons, right? Um, and then the genetic testing, keep in mind, takes about three weeks for the results to come back. It's actually much better than it was before, but it, it still takes three weeks for the results to come back. And so that will actually help kind of get that kick started to be able to inform wh which way to go as the patient or the family is going through the different steps of uh, getting the scans, getting the blood work, all of the different steps uh, to the treatment. And then the last thing I'll share on that is for certain therapy, uh, immunotherapy, as Dr. Wagner mentioned, or the other one that was maybe not mentioned yet is called a PARP inhibitor. For some of these medications, the uh, testing matters to have done right away. So we can actually do the testing as soon as possible and meet with a genetic counselor if need be to get that started right away because it informs the type of treatment or chemotherapy the patient's eligible for. Yeah. The last thing I'll share though is some people really feel and this is only from hearing the experience of patients feel that this is a lot of information to take in, especially if it implicates other members of the family and they may not be ready for the testing at the time. The testing will always be available and the results will not change and could always be used later on to guide the therapy. So keep in mind that we can actually do the testing later if this is not the right time for the person in front of you. Does that help? Yes. Oh, I see a question. Is genetic screening predictive for other family members, or would it simply be indicative that further testing may be prudent? The, the short answer is yes. In many, many cases, the, the genetic testing is predictive of the type of cancers people are at risk of. Uh, I, and I do, the more I do this, I trained in oncology before I trained in genetics. The more I do this now, I don't believe we are, we are equal for our risk of cancer in our lifetime. And so whether we develop cancer at some point in the future or not, we were probably more prone to than others, right? Uh, if, we, if we have a specific type of cancer. So having this information in the family really helps to say, well, do you need prostate cancer screening? Do you need breast cancer screening? Or can you just skip colonoscopies? I don't think anybody should skip colonoscopies altogether, but maybe changing the the, the interval, the frequency between some of these screenings may also matter. So the more we use genetic information, the more it will help predict and uh, organize the screening that one person can have to make more um, impact on the uh, cancer detected early or other interventions that can happen. I see another question is, when is it too late to do this testing for the family? Never. It's never too late to do testing. And, and I'll share, this is something that was not necessarily in the question, but it's also very important to think about banking or saving the DNA for the future, if possible, because the 
we know for sure the technology will change. Your DNA will not change, it will stay the same, but the technology will change and we may very well want to revisit or retest uh, in the future. And if we had a sample stored already, that would be much easier to do than having you come back, especially if you're, you live far away or if there are other um, um, uh, uh, barriers in the way, it would be much easier to be able to do this that way. All right, and I think there's two more questions that we can take and then we'll go to the break. So the first one uh, along the genetics line is, should everyone who has sarcoma have genetic counseling and testing? My opinion is that yes, because it's a very rare type of cancer and it's a cancer that has you know, implications for, um, uh, finding a genetic predisposition has implications for the cancer treatment. But the answer to me is yes. Now, the answer to the insurance is not always yes. And there are available options now that are a lower cost. It's not, it's not um, cheap, but it's at $250 where the, the price of this test could very well be an investment in finding the best option. So there are lower cost options to be able to do genetic testing if it's not covered. We would try really hard to have it covered, but if it's not covered, there are options out there. Okay, great. And then, so the last question before the break is a little bit of a change of topic. So how do past successes and failures with treatments inform or change treatment plans for future patients? So uh, it's an interesting question. I think the key thing for how one treatment might actually impact a future one, I would say, is actually toxicity, where if there's toxicity from one line of therapy, then we of course don't want to have overlapping toxicity with a next line. So we might choose a, a chemo or uh, another drug that will have a different toxicity profile. Um, sometimes if one drug is working and then stops working, we don't of course want to use a medicine that works in the same way as that one because we think it's less likely to work. So that will also impact how we choose the sort of next lines of therapy. Um, but really in most cases, especially with chemotherapy, we don't have a good way of knowing whose tumor is going to respond to one drug versus another. And uh, you know, in spite of all that we know, there is still some component of really trial and error. and uh, taking the drugs that we think are more likely to work and using those first, but then even if a tumor is resistant or starts growing or uh, for whatever reason we have to switch, the next lines of therapy don't, or response to the next lines of therapy don't necessarily uh, occur or not occur based on what happened before. Um, but if there's toxicity from one drug, we don't want to overlap the toxicity. Um, so I hope that answers that. So we'll take a break now. Um, it's scheduled for 10 minutes. We're about 10 minutes behind. Um, so maybe just at 1030, we can all reconvene and uh, we'll start with Joe McNeil from the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation. We'll keep the questions coming because some of the questions that um, are ones that either Dr. Wagner or myself specifically can answer, um, we will also um, talk about at the end too. So we'll make sure to address them all. Well, I can take the pleasure to introduce um, Joe McNeil, who is the executive director of the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation and just such an amazing advocate for our patients and caregivers within this community. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for having me here, everyone. I appreciate it. Um, Ritu is going to, I think, share my screen for me. And as you can see, there it is. Um, so we provide, um, support to sarcoma patients in the Pacific Northwest area. For us, that's Washington, Oregon, Alaska, Idaho, and Montana. And you can also be a patient receiving treatment within our five-state region. Um, and then one of our largest ongoing programs is the financial support grants. Um, they do have to be applied for by a social worker. And then there are some eligibility factors that go with that, like being in active treatment, um, treatment within our service area, 
and then there's a 400% poverty level, um, and your social worker or your patient navigator can help you determine that, uh, whether you're eligible or not. And then we have a $1,500 lifetime maximum, um, but each one is about $250 every six months, and or if you've had it previously, depending on what where you are in the lifetime of things, it will factor in. Um, and then we have care packages, which is another one of our wonderful programs that started uh, during COVID, actually, or just after COVID. And we've kept it going, which has been wonderful for our um, sarcoma patients to receive care packages. And any sarcoma patient in our Pacific Northwest region is eligible. Uh, it does have to be, again, applied for through your social worker, nurse, or your physician, patient navigator. Um, but we do recommend and, and ask, actually, that you apply for them because we want to make sure that you know that you're part of a great community, um, not one that you wanted to sign up for, but you certainly have people behind you that support you beyond your, your physicians. There are organizations like uh, myself that are out there um, to help and, and provide some comfort along the way. We do have um, some, uh, uh, some upcoming programs. So if Richie wants to switch to the next slide for me. Um, so we also provide um, casual chats. They are not support groups, but they are an opportunity for you to speak with other survivors, patients. We have one for caregivers. Uh, we do actually have one for bereavement also, but we um, uh, give you an opportunity to connect with your sarcoma community and share with them, learn from them. The only thing we try to avoid is discussing specifics on diagnoses because every single body is different than the other body. So it never is the same. Um, we um, have a new program that's starting, which is uh, the Knights United is a, a memorial remembrance event. That one is actually in Portland right now. We're working on getting our Seattle date. Um, and then uh, we have research update night, which Dr. Wagner and Dr. Schaub have been wonderful. And actually Dr. Loggers who's on here. So many of the physicians you see here today have actually joined us and presented um, at our researchers update night. We have one coming up on May 17th. Um, and I, I, I'd have to like read the fine print, but please join us. It is an educational opportunity. And then we have one happening in, it just got scheduled. So it's not on here on July 25th. Uh, and I know that one's on desmoid tumors, so because I have that in the back of my head because it just started. So July 25th, we'll be doing that one. Um, and then next for us is, um, uh, let's see, hold on, switch slides again, um, upcoming events to mark your calendar. So we have, go ahead and switch it again, Ritu. <laughs> Thank you. Um, upcoming events. So we have the Hope Grows Here events that are happening in, in April. So Portland is on the 13th. Uh, Spokane's on the 22nd and Seattle's on the 27th. So these are kind of a way for us to get to know who our donors are, who our supporters are, and things like that. They're at various places and you can find the registration on our website. And one of the other big events that we host, and it's a great way for um, the sarcoma, sarcoma community in our area to come together, is the Dragon Slayer Walks. They have been happening for many, many years in this area, and many of you have potentially joined us at them. And if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Uh, Portland is on September 9th. Boise is actually September 16th. Spokane is September 17th. And Seattle is September 23rd. And I will share with you that Dr. Wagner, he will rock it. So come join him. <laughs> he was there last year in full force. In fact, the little small picture in the upper left-hand side is him and his team and people behind him. So I think that was um, pretty much the Fred Hutch team there. <laughs> joining in. And it was a wonderful event. We've been very, very lucky with our weather being in September, um, but registration is officially open. Uh, we do have a, um, for our helps, grants, patients, and so forth, we actually have a code uh, to join for free. Um, so uh, if you have an opportunity, you want to shoot me an email at the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation, I can certainly get that uh, access code for patients um, so that they don't have to endure further expenses as we want you to come join us and be part of your own community. So, and then kind of lastly on this, we have, um, if you wanna switch again for me, Ritu, we've got our interactive social media. So obviously you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And I highly ask you to join us and, and we do Q and A Fridays. So if you have a question for a researcher or a physician that's not specific to diagnoses, we say, 
please send it your, your send it our way. Um, we just did one, actually we recapped what Dr. Shao did for our research update night, which some of what you heard today, which uh, was on proton therapy. And we just kind of did a simple one is what is proton therapy? So um, we ask that you join us in that and uh, share it with your friends and family and let them know what's going on. And then lastly for us, if you'll switch it again, Ritu, is just a thank you to our corporate partners of which Fred Hutch is certainly one of them. Um, they've been a wonderful partner of ours for many years and we welcome them, welcome them year over year. And obviously many of the physicians here at Fred Hutch are also um, uh, researcher update night presenters and supporters and actually even on our board of directors. So. Uh, and that's it for me, unless anybody has any questions that they have about the organization itself or other programs that we might have available. Are there online options? Ah, yes. So the casual chats are completely online and so are the researcher update nights. So thank you for asking that. We do them via Zoom. Um, uh, you, we do ask that you register so you can get the Zoom link and we know that you're coming. Um, but yes, they are all completely done via Zoom. We have we learned obviously through COVID that we wanted to reach out further and our casual chats are open to anybody in the US. So we do have people who, are who participate in our casual chat groups that are from the East Coast. Um, we had a woman who joined us from Russia one day. So uh, we highly recommend that you come join us uh, and uh, learn on our research update nights and then obviously network with your fellow patients and caregivers and so forth at our casual chats. Any other questions for us? Well, that was an easy one. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Um, I can say from personal experience and involvement with the organization that Northwest Sarcoma Foundation has done an amazing job advocating for uh, all patients with sarcoma in the Pacific Northwest. Um, on a somewhat more national level, we're uh, pleased to have Karen Cook here from the Sarcoma Foundation of America uh, and uh, excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. And I am just trying to share my screen here. Uh, let's see here. And hopefully everybody can see that, correct? Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> so thank you for having me here today. My name is Karen Cook. Um, the Sarcoma Foundation of America was founded 22 years ago uh, to fill an unmet need in the sarcoma community. Um, there was obviously lack of funding, advocation, um, and things like that. So we were founded to advocate for sarcoma patients by funding research and by increasing awareness about the disease. Uh, we raise money to privately fund grants for sarcoma research and conduct education and advocacy efforts on behalf of sarcoma patients. We have three pillars that we focus on, research, education, and advocacy. Uh, with research, we are the largest sarcoma-specific private funder of research in the sarcoma community. Since our inception, uh, we've invested over $14 million in research, including over 200 grants, eight American Society of Clinical Oncologists Young Investigator Awards, two Advanced Clinical Research Awards, uh, Conquer Cancer Foundation Awards, and two ASCO Conquer Cancer Foundation Awards. Um, our awards are funded, some of them go through our research grant program, which is funded by our Race to Cure Sarcoma 5K race series, which is held uh, nationally throughout the country. We also partner with uh, sarcoma centers where some of those races take place um, and fund them through grants. Uh, we fund other organizations like SARC and Selective RFPs. And you can see here our funding um, actually goes internationally. Um, all throughout the world and some active grants that, you know, in the sarcoma per year. And while the grants are increasing, um, there's obviously still work that needs to be done in that area. Um, we have started a last mile research award to help with these NIH sar sarcoma grants um, that are awarded each year. Our program um, is a one-year grant program in the amount of 150,000 to support translational science research on the etiology, microlecular biology, um, diagnosis and treatment of human sarcomas. 
It's available for sarcoma researchers to provide funding to strengthen their first resubmission of an NIH uh, R01 proposal. So these are proposals who, you know, scored very high, but didn't quite um, meet the line for funding. So our goal is to be able to fund these grants um, so they can um, gather more information and resubmit and then be um, awarded that NIH grant. So our, we're looking to help fund these even more. Um, and then we also have a patient assist assistance clinical trial that we partner with Jordan's Dream Fund to fund. It's called the Jordan's Dream Fund for Clinical Research. It funds direct expenses related to transportation, lodging, and some medical expenses not covered by insurance necessary for clinical trials. These grants are awarded four times each year quarterly, and the amount will not exceed $5,000. However, there is a chance to apply for an extension if needed. Um, you can find information about these grants on our website. Um, application, applicants do have to be already accepted into a trial or all already participating in a trial. And they're awarded for eligible expenses up to the maximum amount award limit per patient. Um, our next pillar is our patient education. An educated and empowered community is key in efforts to bring change to the sarcoma landscape. Education not only aids patients and caregivers in advocating for their own care, but also helps to build a group of advocates who can work on behalf of others to raise awareness and influence research and drug development activities. So we provide inpatient education sessions on Zoom, interactive webinars, we advocate uh, researcher networking at national levels. In fact, um, our CEO and our director of research were just at ESMO this past week, um, networking and attending sessions there. Um, and we do briefings on the latest developments in sarcoma research. We also do a lot of work with public policy and advocacy. Um, we educate legislators, federal and state agency officials, health and research communities, and the general public about the need for additional research and therapies. We advocate for increased research funding for sarcoma, both from the public and private sectors. Um, we work with other groups, uh, rare cancer groups, where disease coalitions, um, and we partner with trade associations on medical innovation issues to ensure that drug development is not slowed to the detriment of the sarcoma patient community. Uh, we've also worked with Senator Ron Johnson and Brendan Locke, who were able to introduce a resolution um, through the Senate to officially recognize July as Sarcoma Awareness Month. So this resolution passed in both 2021 and 2022, and they are reintroducing this legislation, and we are sure that it will be passed again in 2023. And that is all for me, if anyone has any questions. So there's one question that says, what is SARC? I, I can answer that. So that's a cooperative yeah. group where it's a sort of a collective, I guess, of some academic sarcoma centers. And it's a mechanism to run clinical trials. And the reason it exists is because sarcomas are so rare that um, and sometimes we there just aren't enough patients in one specific site to actually have a large enough clinical trial to make it meaningful. So there are some studies that are open really across the country that are being operated through SARC. And uh, you know, we have actually a few of those studies uh, available in Seattle, um, but the same studies, at least that are run through SARC that are available here are also available at other places like Memorial Sloan Kettering, for example, in New York and, and a bunch of others. Um, so that's what SARC is. Um, I actually have one quick question. If you can maybe just expand a little bit on the patient grant for participation in clinical trials. Um, I thought that was interesting and something that our patients can potentially take advantage of. Sure. Um, 
so we have we award them quarterly. Um, applications are submitted online. There is no um, we don't need your receipts for um, any travel expenses. What the application does is ask you to estimate um, what you would need the money for, whether it be planes, hotels, um, mileage, gas, anything like that. Um, and you fill that out. Um, along with some other information, we do need the physician. Um, there's a section for the physician who is treating you or on the clinical trial to fill that out. Um, and then we look at that there um, and we take a look and see, you know, how far are you traveling? You know, how long is the trial and things like that and award the grants based on that. And then we issue a check and Yeah, that's great. That sounds like a wonderful resource. Um, so um, I suspect you might be hearing from us to take <laughs> advantage of that at some point. Uh, yes, so thank you I, very much. I will. Um, I don't know if we can. I can put the link in the um, chat for um, more information on that, which links to the application um, and additional information more specific yep. to that. That'd be great. So, uh, and just along those lines, so I did put in the links for just the main websites for Northwest Sarcoma Foundation and Sarcoma Foundation of America in the chat. Um, but if there's a specific link to that program, I think that would also be very helpful. So um, I know Dr. Loggers has a plane to catch, so <laughs> I want to move on. Um, so Dr. Loggers, in addition to being one of our uh, excellent sarcoma medical oncologist, is also the director of palliative care at Fred Hutch. And uh, she is going to give a talk about supportive care and how that plays a role for patients with sarcoma. And so thank you very much for giving this talk, especially uh, for joining us from the airport. Hi, everybody. Uh, bonjour from Montreal, <laughs> where I've been away, um, actually at a supportive care conference. I hope the audio is okay. Uh, please, you know, let me know if it's not. I tried to find a quiet place. Um, and thank you for that kind introduction and for the invitation to be here. Um, and thank you, Dr. Schaub, for advancing my slides. We just wanted to make sure that um, hopefully my, um, <laughs> uh, that this would all work out. So uh, next slide. Uh, and I just want to briefly say I don't have any disclosures related to this work. Uh, and, um, but I do have a couple of goals. One of the goals is really to provide information about what supportive care exactly is and why it's important for people with sarcoma. And then the second goal is, uh, is to, through the presentation, uh, but also at the end, to highlight some examples of research that are uh, going on, uh, particularly at Fred Hutch, and particularly because we were lucky enough to receive a grant from a, a generous family that allows for pilot studies of research like this that uh, is often, you know, when you think about sarcoma research being unfunded, you know, this kind of research specific to sarcoma is even less well-funded. So we're so grateful for those opportunities. But before I make any assumptions, I want to define what quality of life is. So um, next slide, please. Um, Oh, yeah, that one. Thank you. Uh, so the World Health Organization defines quality of life as an individual's perception of their position in life in the context of the culture and values in which they live and in relation to their own goals, expectations, standards, and concerns. And that's a mouthful. You know, it's always leave it to the World Health Organization. Uh, but one way that we can understand what do they really mean by that is by looking at what they measure. And so on the screen are the domains that they actually measure when they're trying to understand an individual's quality of life. And um, you know, what I hope you'll see is that it takes into account a lot of different things. And uh, when we are speaking specifically about health and health-related quality of life, which is, just, is its own concept, we usually focus most on the first four uh, domains that you see there and a little bit on the last one, usually kind of de-emphasizing the environment or the home environment, even though we know it's incredibly important. And we know that patient-reported outcomes, which are pros, are one of the ways that we really understand quality of life because uh, people tell us what their quality of life is. There's also this other idea of um, PREMS, which are patient reported experience measures, where we try to understand people's experience of their healthcare and um, uh, in particular. And this is, both of these pros and PREMS are an expanding area of research in supportive care. And, and um, while most 
measures of quality of life, especially health-related quality of life, are not sarcoma-specific. Many are more are becoming uh, sarcoma-specific. So, for example, we now have what's called Goddess, uh, which is a patient-reported outcome specifically for people with desmoid. And I had the opportunity to participate in um, at least one of the randomized trials for uh, desmoid and therapy for desmoid, in which we used this particular patient-reported outcome that was specifically designed to help us understand the experience of desmoid patients. And so, we expect that over time, these kinds of measures are going to be developed and validated in um, in our specific sarcoma subtypes. Next slide, please. Um, so, but again, why is supportive care important? So we've got this idea of what quality of life is and what health-related quality of life is. Well, we know that when you're undergoing treatment for sarcoma, a lot is going on. You know, there are pain, there's symptoms, there might be mood changes or functional changes, financial burdens and logistical challenges. Like just simply, how am I going to get to all these appointments? Uh, who's going to drive me? How long am I going to be in infusion and that kind of thing? Um, next paragraph or slide, excuse me. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to give some, um, some examples of what we know from research about uh, what people are going through that might make supportive care more valuable to them. So this is a, a study among AYAs, which are adolescents and young adults with sarcoma. A lot of our information about sarcoma comes from this population. And these are the symptoms uh, when people presented for health care for their sarcoma. So this is this was a 803 12 to 24 year olds in England. And 122 of these folks had sarcoma of the bones or the soft tissues. And these are the top 10 symptoms that they had when they presented. Um, most of the folks with bone sarcomas had two to three symptoms or more. And most of the folks with soft tissue sarcomas had at least one, but there was a range for all of this. Um, it, and what's interesting is about 27% of folks uh, reported that they had waited a month or more to seek help uh, for their sarcoma. And that's not unusual. We see that all the time. And you may uh, uh, have had that experience as well as a person with sarcoma. Um, sometimes it's uh, the time is made longer by the fact that the you know doctors that you may first inter uh, interact with really don't know what it is, don't, don't know what they're dealing with, and it takes time to get to that diagnosis. But uh, next slide. This slide's also just showing some other examples of um, the kinds of things that one can potentially be facing after that diagnosis of sarcoma. There can be psychological distress, and that can be about what is my treatment, uh, fears or worries about the cancer itself, or worries about your family, your children, um, the finances, all of that. Um, people can also report depression and anxiety, particularly in the first six months of diagnosis, but, but that, uh, those concerns um, can actually extend for the first couple of years after a diagnosis before we start to see uh, significant differences in, in, the, um, in the reports of uh, depression and anxiety in some studies. Um, we also know that this can be more, that depression and anxiety can be more common among people with progressive disease and those with um, sarcomas that are involving the core of the body as opposed to the, the extremities. And we also know from some studies that the longer you're on therapy, you may be having, you know, more symptoms and poor quality of life. And it makes sense, right? You know, as you go through treatment, that can be really wearing on people and you can start experiencing different toxicities because what you're being exposed to, especially when you're getting chemotherapy, um, may be very different from drug to drug. I'm not going to spend any time talking about the kinds of um, symptoms and signs and things that go on for people who have um, who, who have completed their treatment for their sarcoma, especially because we know we have uh, speakers later who are going to talk about survivorship. But just suffice it to say that, uh, you know, all of the things that it, it can happen to people while they're undergoing treatment can follow them into that survivorship period um, with lasting effects of, you know, for example, you know, pain or peripheral neuropathy, those kinds of things, maybe mood differences or differences in their ability to interact socially to hold down a job and, that, and, and those kinds of things. So next slide, please. Um, I also just want to pause for a minute and say that, you know, most individuals with sarcoma are not going through this alone. They have other important people in their life. Uh, and this was a study of um, 33 caregivers uh, in Australia who were asked in a qualitative study. So basically they were asked questions and they spoke out loud and people then went back to analyze what did they say and this kind of shows you the themes that came out of that that were very important from the caregiver or important other loved one you know we use a lot of different language for who these people are but um and, and it makes sense right that you know what they were worried about is how do how do they how do they help? How do they do a good job in this new role for which they probably never have had training uh, as nurse and pharmacist and, and all of these things but 
Um, they also needed support for themselves and information about what to expect. And I call that anticipatory guidance because most people haven't gone through a serious illness before. So they don't know what's coming. They don't know how to prepare for it. And these are also the ways in which supportive care can be helpful. Um, and then, of course, financial uh, um, support. And we've heard some about uh, some new ways in which we might be having uh, financial support for people. So that's wonderful. Next slide, please. So we talked a lot about um, uh, the kinds of you know symptoms and distress, and and all of these are important because they indicate human suffering. Uh, we know that people. Um, can have all of these things when they're diagnosed with sarcoma. But, the, but I think the other point that I wanted to make is that there's likely an association between these things and how likely you are to die of your disease. And this association between quality of life and cancer has been made in many, many um, cancers, even after taking into account the kinds of things that we think would be associated both with quality of life and with your risk of dying of your disease, like, you know, what is your stage or, you know, what is your grade of your disease? This is one of the first studies uh, to really be specific to sarcoma. Um, and this was um, more than 1,100 adults with sarcoma uh, who were diagnosed between 2017 and 2020 at 39 German centers. So this is a European study in which people completed what is called the European Organization for the Research and Treatment of Cancer Quality of Life Measure. So this is the EORTC30. And you may have seen this in studies as you're looking and learning about sarco uh, sarcomas and other cancers. It's been used and validated um, many, many times. And so while it's not sarcoma specific, we do think it's a good measure of quality of life, global health-related quality of life globally. And in the study, they included bone, soft tissue, and just patients. And in that first year, uh, 126 people actually died of their disease. And so they wanted to understand that relationship or that association between the quality of life when they were first diagnosed and then what happened to them. And so uh, what you're seeing here are the usual kinds of like survival curves that I'd be showing if I were doing a talk around chemotherapy and the likelihood that someone would survive, uh, you know, longer with their cancer because of a treatment that, you know, we are studying. Uh, but in this case, the, the intervention or the treatment is, you know, is really quality of life. And so they're showing you what the survival was for people who had different reported quality of life at baseline. And I also wanted to show you the curves for pain. And this is because of all the symptoms that we uh, know that sarcoma people you know, people with uh, sarcoma can have, um, this is one of the ones that we know we can make a dent in. We know we can actually treat your pain and make it better. Um, so uh, what you're seeing is that um, the, basically that the, what's called the hazard ratio or the likelihood that someone might die in the first year after diagnosis um, was 0 0.73 per 10 point increase in global quality of life score. So as your quality of life got better, you were uh, less likely to uh, experience death in that first year. And, and the reverse of that, um, you know, or saying it in a different way is, is to say um, that people were 30% less likely to die as they improved uh, 10 points in their quality of life. And this was uh, somewhat similar for pain. So they, they did it in the opposite direction. So if, you, uh, if your pain was um, uh, worse, uh, then you were more likely uh, to pass away by 14%. Uh, um, the, the hazard ratio in that case was 1.14. So, you know, I, I, there's, of course, a difference between causation and association. And so this doesn't prove um, that changing quality of life will necessarily lead to better outcomes. But, but this is the kind of thing that we're trying to better understand when we think about supportive care. And this study, when they mapped out these survival curves, took into account, like I said, all of the things that you would have thought would have been and that are known to be predictive of, of dying of sarcoma. Um, so, so the reason this is important is because we know that there are supportive care interventions that have data behind them to suggest that they either improve quality of life or that they might actually improve mortality. So for example, maintaining your weight or not losing additional weight um, and, and things like early palliative care um, have been associated with improvements in survival. And so that's why this is important. Uh, next slide. 
And we just want to, you know, hammer home this point that you can improve your quality of life. If you're not satisfied with it, there are likely ways that people may be able to help you feel better and tolerate more treatment. And usually those are by incorporating supportive care uh, clinicians, people who have expertise in supportive care into your cancer care. Next slide. Um, at Fred Hutch, uh, we have a, a, a group of different kinds of supportive care services that are shown here. I'm really just going to focus on um, spiritual health, integrative uh, medicine, and palliative care because I think most of you have interacted with social workers. We have good data to suggest that that's one of our most used services. Um, patient navigation is really around the logistical things we talked about, like you know how do you transportation, you know paying for things, nutrition. I hope is obvious you know, what you're eating and how it affects, you know, your health and your well-being. We are, and later today, um, next, we have actually talks by our rehabilitation uh, medicine doctor, Dr. Hannah Hunter, uh, who's a physiatrist and, and um, with Jenny Hamilton, who's going to be speaking about uh, survivorship. So I'm not going to linger on that. Next slide at all, but I do want to just take a minute to define what integrative oncology or innovative uh, integrative medicine is. And these are, um, uh, uh, and patient-centered, evidence-informed uh, field of cancer supportive care that basically thinks about things like mind, um, body practices, natural products, and lifestyle modifications like exercise and things like that to make us um, feel better and tolerate more treatment. Um, next slide. Uh, palliative care or palliative medicine is, is similar in that it is also a specialized team of uh, clinicians who have gotten additional training to try to help people uh, um, manage their symptoms, cope better with uh, cancer, and for example, receive anticipatory guidance and, and support um, for their care. Um, next slide. And what's most important from the, uh, from the lens of a palliative care clinician is that we really understand who you are, what's important to you, um, what are the activities that are critical to how you define yourself. So for example, if you play the violin or the cello or the guitar, obviously treatments that might affect your ability to do that in the future are going to have a different meaning potentially for you than somebody who doesn't do these things, right? So we try to understand um, what's important to you and then manipulate your experience to ensure that your quality of life is as good as it can be. Um, next slide. And then spiritual health, I think there's a lot of... Um, uh, assumptions and mythology about what spiritual health clinicians are doing. I think some people think that this is, you know, somebody from a particular religious or spiritual background that is trying to um, recruit. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we know that that's not the case. That's not the training. Um, they're here to support your spiritual life. And the, your spiritual life is about your beliefs, your values, your behaviors, and your experiences um, with your culture and with the transcendent. And the goal really is to help find meaning, healing, and purpose uh, in the face of a serious illness diagnosis. And we know from many studies that this is something that can frequently be challenging. Um, who am I? Um, what, why is this happening to me? Um, how can I redefine myself in the context of this where I may be losing some of those other identities that I have? Next slide. And I just wanted to point out some research that uh, was recently reported in JAMA, which is one of our, you know, really um, uh, um, uh, well-known uh, academic journals. And this study basically looked at um, nearly 9,000 articles uh, looking for the highest quality evidence uh, to support spiritual care. And they distilled that down to the 371 uh, uh, highest quality studies. Um, and basically... Uh, using a method where they spoke with experts about that data and about the evidence came up with these uh, um, basically six uh, highest ranking evidence-based statements about spiritual health and the role that it ought to be playing in healthcare. And so I'm not going to read it to you because I, I hope that I, um, I'm not going to go too far over, um, uh, but, um, but just want to uh, impress again that this is an area of research and this is um, underlining and underscoring how important these supportive care services can be for people. Um, next slide. And then next slide and just go straight to the, so I just want to conclude on, um, as I mentioned before, uh, some studies that are happening here at the Fred Hutch um, that are kind of examples of the different kinds of research uh, that can be happening within supportive care. 
Um, this is one of our Anderson pilots, and uh, you may have heard me speak about this. I spoke uh, for the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation proudly. Uh, thank you for that opportunity um, about this uh, work that we're doing to understand how people cope uh, and, and how um, things like distress can affect coping and how you, as you interact with important others in your life, how you each affect each other in your coping, and how can we use this information to design interventions that will help people cope better and potentially have better quality of life and, and less distress. And we've uh, been very thankful for the participation potentially with, uh, of some of you on the call right now um, who have been willing to share with us your, your personal experience and, and how you are managing. Next slide. And uh, coming soon uh, to a clinic near you <laughs> is work around mobility and functional status and how this is currently for you and how it might change in the future and how do we help people plan for those differences in mobility and function. And this work we're proudly doing with one of our surgeons, Elise Brinkman, uh, and, um, and our uh, physical therapist and, and uh, physiatrist, Dr. Hunter, who you'll hear from next. Uh, but it's just, again, it's an example of the kind of uh, um, research uh, that is going on in this area that we think is really going to change the experience for sarcoma patients. Next slide. Um, and then I just wanted to leave people with some somewhere to go, something to think about, um, because we uh, appreciate that these talks are ephemeral, right? The, uh, what you take away um, is variable, but hopefully these things will help. Um, and just a reminder that these supportive care services are available to you if you're receiving your care at Fred Hutch or often no matter where you are these things do exist um, the thing to do is to ask your medical team if one of these supportive care services seems appropriate for you next slide um, this is uh, we did, we're not really talking today at all about cancer prevention and I know that that um, may not be where some people are because they're already within their cancer journey but again we're trying to also think actively about cancer prevention across cancers and even after you have a diagnosis how to stay healthy and so here are some um, cancer prevention and actually the same recommendations stand for individuals who currently have cancer or who are survivors. Um, so uh, I hope that that'll be of use to you. And then the last one is uh, our Cook for Your Life website, which is hosted by the Fred Hutch um, and, and uh, our integrative medicine medical director, Dr. Heather Greenlee, um, uh, uh, who's a naturopath. Uh, and this has just tons of um, uh, recipes, uh, literature and, and, and the like uh, to try to help people eat well. Uh, and feel better uh, while they're uh, receiving treatment or in survivorship. So I'm gonna pause there uh, and just thank everyone so much for your attention and for your patience while I give this talk uh, in the airport. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ritu, yes, for putting that in the, um, in the chat. I think we have a couple minutes to take a couple questions for Dr. Loggers since she has a plane to catch. So if you just um, put them into the chat, then we can go ahead and get started. And we'll try to um, share with everyone some of the additional links um, throughout the talk in the chat. So look out for those too. I answered everything. <laughs> well, I hope everyone has a fantastic uh, rest of the conference. Well, thank you very much. Have a safe trip back, safe thank flight. You. Yes. Thank you. Um, all righty. So, Next up is Dr. Uh, Hannah Hunter, um, who uh, Dr. Loggers had mentioned in her talk. Um, but Dr. Hunter is the medical director of our rehab medicine uh, team, and uh, we'll talk about physical activity and exercise. Hey, 
Thanks so much for the intro. Um, let me make sure some of my slides are showing up. Is that a, is it, we have a PowerPoint yep. slide up? That looks right. Um, uh, thank you again, and really um, excited to be able to share some of this um, information with everyone. Um, like Dr. Wagner um, described, I'm the, I lead our rehab team at Fred Hutch. Um, I'm a board certified physiatrist, AKA a rehab physician. Um, and the field of physiatry really focuses on mobility and function. And I'll share a little bit about what we know and how that translates into oncology care. Um, some goals for this talk is just to define what oncology rehab is and why it matters. Um, an exercise prescription, a pacing plan, uh, because exercise, uh, just like oncology treatment, is not a one-size-fits-all. We have to really take a personalized and tailored approach, um, and that's a constantly changing um, kind of prescription and plan, as well as a role of, role of rehabilitation, particularly after radiation and orthopedic surgeries for the treatment of sarcoma. First, I'll share my kind of favorite definition of what cancer rehab is, and it's defined um, in the literature as medical care that should be integrated throughout the oncology care continuum and delivered by trained rehab professionals to diagnose um, and treat patients' physical, psychological, and cognitive impairments in an effort to maintain or restore function, reduce symptom burden, maximize independence, and improve quality of life. And the, the kind of backstory of this is that rehab providers have been treating um, musculoskeletal and functional changes, such as um, you know, providing amputee care, care for individuals who've had a stroke, um, non-surgical orthopedics, knee pain, shoulder pain, back pain. And we are realizing that while these um, changes kind of occur, occur independently from injuries or um, different medical conditions, that a lot of this occurs during cancer treatment as well as from cancer. And we're translating what we know about that type of rehab care into the oncology care continuum. Um, I want to start with a few definitions because I think a lot of the times we interchange these words, but there's nuances in their definition and it can become really important in terms of how we're implementing rehab plans for individuals um, during cancer treatment because there are so many factors limiting um, our uh, patient endurance and uh, fatigue and just ability to do things. So we want to be really tailored and specific in and the words we're using and our exercise treatment plan. So physical activity is defined as bodily movement produced by uh, muscles that results in energy expenditure. So anything that you do is that's kind of taking energy from the, our overall gas tank. So that can be household chores, um, uh, what you do for work versus exercise is a planned, uh, structured and repetitive movement that has the objective or direct objective of maintaining or improving physical fitness. And physical fitness is also this broad category of words that can include endurance, uh, muscular strength, your body composition, flexibility. And so when we talk about patient-specific goals, we want to know what do you want to be able to do, whether it's carry a basket of laundry, you know, down a flight of stairs, return to work that might be labor-intensive, or just improve your strength because you don't feel like you're at your baseline. So we want to use these words correctly for a plan that's tailored to you. Um, and while I, I'm a huge advocate for physical activity and exercise, there, there are experts who've studied this field and found that um, it's not only improvement, not only important in improving physical fitness, but it's related to so many other quality of life outcomes during and after cancer treatment. And this is a, a fairly new and growing field of research information that we're learning. And really, it's only in the past few years that these recommendations are being integrated into oncology guidelines. And not necessarily sarcoma specific, but oncology care specific. Um, in 2018, ACSM, which is the um, American College of Sports Medicine, um, had this roundtable discussion of experts on exercise. And they looked at all the exercise studies that have been done in cancer uh, patients with cancer and in survivorship. And they found that um, there's you know, a particular dose that might be effective in improving these quality of life measures, as well as a direct correlation of physical activity and improving these outcomes. And that is an improvement, improvement in fatigue, 
improved sleep, decreased risk of falls, improving your mood, and kind of aligning with survivorship or improvement in oncology outcomes, we have to look at life beyond cancer as well. And we know that exercise plays a huge role in improving bone health and cardiovascular health because we not only want to treat cancer within that period of time um, of a patient's life, but look at longevity and long-term outcomes of other things that can play a role in um, uh, health-related health related outcomes. And the thing that I think is arguably most important is that exercise can help you do the things that you want to do. A common phrase is exercise is medicine. And so we, we probably kind of hear it from the media. We hear it from um, maybe providers that exercise is helpful, um, but there's so much exercise out there. How do we know what's going to work and what's going to be helpful uh, to a patient? So just like medicines are prescribed, I think exercise should be prescribed in terms of a dose, frequency, and uh, most importantly, how do we know if it's working and what side effects should we look out for so that we're getting be benefit, really, truly, like bang for your buck in terms of the exercises that you're doing rather than uh, contributing to fatigue or pain. And this infographic uh, is available on the Exercises Medicine website, uh, specifically called Moving Through Cancer. And it shows the outcomes of that roundtable discussion that was held in 2018, showing that there's strong evidence that exercise can improve fatigue, quality of life, um, function, anxiety, depression, and lymphedema, which is the type of swelling that can occur when the lymphatic system or lymph nodes are um, affected. And after looking at all these exercise studies, the, the dose that this, this expert panel came up with was 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise and two to three times a week of strength training a week. And this is not to say that you go from walking two minutes a day to 150 minutes a day. We really need a graded pacing plan to get to that 150 minutes, but the ultimate goal um, that's also in alignment with American C Cancer Society physical activity goals is 150 minutes to 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. So now we have a kind of an idea of what we should be doing, but still not the most specific. And it's a little hard to come home with uh, uh, that recommendation and know what to do. So we'll focus a little bit on that. So what is moderate intensity aerobic activity? Uh, more so than measuring, your heart rate, or we don't expect anyone to really measure their heart rate at all times of the day to know what household chores are resulting in um, uh, a moderate intensity threshold. But a general rule of thumb is that if you are um, breathing to the point where you can still carry a conversation but can't sing a song, that's moderate intensity exercise. Light intensity physical activity or exercise would be being able to sing a song while you do whatever task you're doing rigorous intensity, you're really huffing and puffing and can't get some words out. So if you're going on a brisk walk with someone and able to talk on the phone or someone with you, you're in that moderate intensity zone. Strength training does not necessarily mean that you're lifting weights and going to the gym using fancy equipment, but um, you're doing something that's making the muscles work and really challenging the joints and the muscles. My favorite resistance training exercise to prescribe to, to patients is a sit to stand or however way you're transferring out of a seated surface. So that could be with a cane or a walker, but it's an exercise that targets our big kind of power horse muscles around the abs, the core, the glutes and the thighs, because um, most of the time it's much more challenging for us to get in and out of a chair or in and out of a car than to walk a few feet. So it's a resistance exercise that can be incredibly helpful. Another time of a strength training that doesn't necessarily require fancy weights or equipments are isometrics. So isometrics are exercise where you're not moving the joints or the muscles, but you're still putting a load on it. And we've all been there when we're at a grocery store and we hold the basket or we hold the bag. And after a few seconds to minutes, the upper arm bicep gets sore. It's because that muscle's being told to, be, um, to work isometrically. And that can also include being in a plank position, which is a push-up position or standing on one leg, all in that resistance training, strength training category. And while um, 
some can kind of create an exercise plan or a physical activity plan and pacing plan on their own. A lot of patients do require interdisciplinary team. And I really think of this as an athlete who's kind of out of, you know, normal competitive play with an injury. Um, they don't just come up with a rehab team, on, rehab plan on their own, but it really requires a coach and athletic training, potentially PT and some medical doctors. And I really think a rehab team can be integral to um, maintaining or improving physical function during cancer treatment. Um, it can include a physiatrist like myself, physical therapy, which focuses on strengthening big muscle groups, balance. Occupational therapy can fine tune um, fine motor skills or dexterity, as well as um, recommend adaptive equipment to make the home more safe, particularly for activities of daily living. So that's dressing, toileting, bathing, and so on. Um, didn't focus it too much on this talk, but um, speech language pathology um, are speech therapists who can um, provide strategies for improved memory, cognition, swallowing, and speech. And I'll talk a little bit about um, prosthetics and orthotics in the next slide. Rehab psychologists are psychologists on our rehab team that help patients kind of cope with any change in mobility or function. And while there's distress from a cancer diagnosis or cancer treatment in the survivorship realm, a lot of um, distress can be related to changes in quality of life and function. So ability to do things or return to work. And that's where our rehab psychologists come in. And I'll uh, talk a little bit about the role of rehab, particularly in orthopedic surgeries or sarcoma treatment, particularly when there is uh, a sarcoma in the arm or the leg or in the pelvis um, and surgeries involved. We know that the, some muscles are going to be weak, some muscles are going to be removed. And despite, despite that, we can still figure out ways to, for patients to be as mobile and as independent as possible with certain braces. Uh, prosthetics if an amputation surgery is involved, and our rehab team kind of guides patients throughout that entire process to answer questions before that happens, but also tailor a brace or prosthetic to, to a patient. So for example, if someone's a commercial fisherman, we're going to need that prosthetic to be waterproof versus someone who's a wildlife photographer, the ankle and the foot joint needs to be mobile to navigate different terrains. Our physical and occupational therapists can work on safety as well as progression to being as independent as you can be. And in, in for patients who've had radiation, particularly to the arm, leg, or pelvis, um, we want to maintain range of motion in the joints involved as much as possible. Um, sometimes that involves stretching splints or braces to be used for walking or doing certain activities. And sometimes there's something, uh, there's swelling in the arm or the leg due to lymphedema, and we have specialized therapists who are trained particularly in uh, complete decongestive therapy, which is an intervention for lymphedema. And lastly, I'll share a little bit about pacing. So it, we, we know that 150 minutes to 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity is recommended for patients during and after a cancer treatment. But we don't expect anyone from, from feeling fatigued to all of a sudden doing 150 minutes of activity. It's like running a marathon without any training. So we come up with a pacing plan. So this is a pre-planned strategy in combination with a graded physical activity program to increase your overall capacity for exercise. And part of this is being conscious of what your new baseline is. And that's not a forever baseline, but a temporary baseline where we can slowly increase about 10% a week, which is kind of what we tell runners who are re recovering from an injury and getting back into running. But you can't walk um, uh, 10 minutes one day and expect that 20 minutes is gonna be no problem the next day because that's basically double the energy expenditure. Or even if you're gonna walk one, walk one block and walk two blocks the next day, that's a huge increase. So we want to slowly build up your endurance, add in a few minutes of activity during the day, which I call exercise snacks. So that can be just practicing that sit to stand movement um, and being mindful of that progression of how many sets of any strength training or aerobic activity that you're doing. And um, I put in this RPE scale. So that's um, relative perceived exertion. 
um, just because we found that patients are much better at gauging their own exertion than us or exercise professionals telling them so many reps and so on. So overall, if your exertion is graded from one to 10 with 10 being max effort and one being very light activity, we wanna stay in that six, uh, one to six zone for light to moderate intensity activity. And last, I'll just keep this uh, definition up on what cancer rehab is and happy to take any questions. You know, there was a question earlier. I was wondering if you could speak to some of the other techniques within your armamentarium or that you help coordinate for folks that do have that very dense post-surgical, post-radiation fibrosis or scar tissue that is resulting in some of those contractions or pain or other problems. Sure. Um, I'd say part of it is recognizing that some of these symptoms are, are developing as early as possible. So if we can, um, we have uh, different treatment modalities that are like manual to really try to soften tissue. And we know that there's not necessarily a quick fix once, you know, um, uh, fibrosis has been present for a long time, but particularly right after um, radiation treatment um, uh, and the skin is kind of healed from anything that's affected the kind of most outer layer, we can really work on softening the outer layer of the skin with different manual techniques and different um, uh, textures to make the skin as soft as possible. But then we also have to think of like what's deeper to the skin. So those are that those are the muscles and tendons. So that's where the exercise and range of motion comes in because we want it to be um, uh, pain free, but uh, also result in some improvement over time. Sometimes dedicated exercise is only a few minutes of the day. So where splints and braces can come in handy is that then you're having something manually help position a joint um, for multiple hours of the day, because it's really hard for us to spend five hours a day doing those repetitive stretching exercises. So some splints can be used while you're sleeping to, to get maximal range of motion in a certain joint, um, versus some can be used when you're doing a particular activity um, such as walking. Um, some, some stretching splints are actually dynamic, so they'll actually provide tension while you're using them to help with this active stretch rather than just being passive with Velcro straps. So we try to figure out what fits um, someone's lifestyle as well as stage of treatment. Okay, there is a Question that says, how do you balance RPE with risk due to AFib? Um, great question. So when there's kind of cardiovascular or, or heart or lung related conditions, um, when we're thinking about um, aerobic activity, there's ways that we can um, be mindful of safety in terms of what position you're doing the exercise. Um, so, for example, if someone ha there has a risk or a neurologic symptom or a cardiovascular symptom, placing them at risk for falls or imbalance, um, then we want to stick to aerobic exercises, maybe when you're on a machine, which we'll say closed chain. So you're always on a surface or making contact with something. So um, not having a risk of kind of uh, feeling lightheaded or potentially falling. Um, even with strength training exercises, we'll um, try to stay in that um, low to moderate intensity zone with exercises where you're laying on a mat or in a chair and doing repetitive exercises rather than um, anything dynamic where your body's coming off the ground, like jumping or jogging or being on your feet. And we make sure that that is safe first. And then we get a gauge of what that exertion zone means for you. And then we can translate that to a, let's say potentially um, more dynamic movements. But we start with a stable surface and stable uh, exercise program in terms of where your body uh, is in space and then progress that after we know you're safe. All right, well, wonderful. Thank you so much.
for taking the time out of your Saturday to give us uh, that wonderful talk. Um, we have one more talk to sort of finish out the morning, and then we'll have a more dedicated question and answer time. Now, there's some questions that have been posted in the chat. Keep those coming. One note, though, when you're thinking of questions, so we cannot answer sort of personalized medical questions. So just keep that in mind when you're posting. Those should be directed really to your clinical team, but we'll do our best. Um, uh, actually, I'll just because it was related, so I see a question just popped up. How do we set up an appointment with uh, rehab medicine? So uh, ask your clinical team, and uh, I'm sure really any of us would be happy to put that referral in, and then uh, that can sort of trigger that appointment to get set up. Um, so uh, the last talk of the morning is actually a pre-recorded talk, um, but uh, this is a recording by Jenny Hamilton, who's one of the physician assistants in our sarcoma clinic, um, who is also really spearheading some of our efforts with survivorship. Um, so she'll introduce sarcoma survivorship and talk about some important topics uh, related to that. Hello, this talk is about sarcoma survivorship. We have developed a new type of clinic visit at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. This is a disease specific survivorship visit dedicated to our sarcoma patients. First, we will start with some definitions. Who is a cancer survivor and what is cancer survivorship? The American Cancer Society defines a cancer survivor as anyone who has ever been diagnosed with cancer, no matter where they are in the course of their disease. What is survivorship? The National Cancer Institute has this definition. Survivorship focuses on the health and well being of a person with cancer from the time of diagnosis until the end of life. This includes the physical, mental, emotional, social, and financial effects of cancer that begin at diagnosis and continue through treatment and beyond. Where does survivorship fit into the sarcoma journey? The sarcoma patient's experience could be divided up into three phases. First, the diagnosis phase, when you might undergo scans and a biopsy to arrive at the diagnosis of sarcoma. Once a diagnosis has been made, you would enter a treatment phase. This would include treatments such as chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery, sometimes all three. After treatment is done, you would enter a follow-up phase, or sometimes we call this the surveillance phase. Uh, this is when you would be coming back to clinic for regularly scheduled scans and exams to monitor for recurrence or monitoring for spread of the disease. A survivorship visit would usually be recommended between one to two years after the end of treatment. It could be any time after treatment ends. These are the things that we will talk about in this uh, talk. Uh, what is sarcoma survivorship? What occurs during a survivorship visit? What happens after a survivorship visit? How to request a survivorship visit at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and where you could learn more about survivorship. The first question, what is, can what is sarcoma survivorship? Survivorship includes recovering from your sarcoma treatment, supporting your health after sarcoma treatment, and helping you to return to your physical activities or sometimes new physical activities after treatment. Uh, also learning about possible late effects of sarcoma treatment. What occurs during a survivorship visit? A survivorship visit is a one hour visit with your team APP. This person would already be familiar to you. Uh, this is your nurse practitioner or your PA uh, or the person you are normally seeing for your follow-up scans and exams. We usually do a survivorship visit with telehealth, but it could also be in person if you prefer. 
We would discuss any topics you wish, and I have some examples of those on a later slide. We will review your treatment summary and care plan. Um, I will also explain what those are on the next slide. What is a treatment sum summary? Uh, the treatment summary is uh, the example of that is here on this slide. This um, is prepared by the survivorship nurse at Fred Hutchinson's Cancer Center. Her name is Deb Loeker, and she prepares all the treatment summaries and care plans. Um, the treatment summary includes the patient's general information at the top, um, all the team members, uh, of, on the care team. Um, this would be your surgeon, your medical oncologist, and your radiation oncologist. We also like to include your primary care physician and their contact number um, and information on that um, part of the treatment summary. Um, it, the next part is um, where we would include your cancer diagnosis information um, your oncology history, uh, this includes your biopsy, how you presented with your symptoms that led to the diagnosis. Um, after the diagnosis, the treatment uh, portion of the, of the treatment summary, which includes um, any chemotherapy that you had, radiation dates and doses, and surgical um, dates. Also, it would include any complications or delays in your treatment. So after the treatment summary, we go over the care plan, and this includes um, your surveillance protocol, the scans and visits, and how often you need to be seen. Uh, it would also outline possible late effects of your treatment and what to watch out for. It includes recommendations to manage long-term symptoms of your treatment and recommendations that can guide your primary care provider or family doctor. Um, um, this example shows um, uh, an outline of the uh, long-term effects, um, and we usually tailor this to your treatment um, and things that you specifically could be looking out for and also it includes ways to manage or um, um, minimize the potential late effects of your treatment. Um, other topics that we would discuss during your visit, this would be totally up to the patient. Um, we can discuss long-term effects of treatment. Um, a lot of times we discuss fear of recurrence and uncertainty. Um, we can discuss exercise, nutrition, um, sexuality and intimacy concerns after cancer treatment and after cancer diagnosis. Memory and concentration can be um, important topics to discuss, especially after chemotherapy. And we do have resources available for all of these topics. What happens after a survivorship visit? You would receive a copy of your treatment summary and care plan. This would come to you in the mail after your visit, along with a survivorship notebook. We'll talk about the survivorship notebook in another slide. Uh, your treatment summary and care plan would also be shared with your local provider, and you would also be offered an optional nutrition consultation. And we will talk about that in an another slide. The survivorship notebook. This is an example of the table of contents of the survivorship notebook. It contains information about cancer survivorship in general. Uh, there are resources for survivor topics, uh, such as fear of recurrence, healthy diet recommendations, physical activity recommendations, and stress management. What is a nutrition consultation for survivorship? The Fred Hutch has um, a, sur a sur survivorship nutrition program, and you would be able to have a consultation with one of our dietitians. Uh, usually this person is Paula, and her um, photo is there. 
um, she can discuss sarcoma specific diet and nutrition recommendations, including long term imp impacts of treatment um, and managing those long term impacts with diet and nutrition. She can also recommend um, a plan for weight management if that is what you're looking for. So how can you request a sarcoma survivorship visit at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center? Um, Fred Hutch patients can just call our scheduling coordinators at the clinic line 606-2018, um, or you can send a message to your sarcoma team uh, through your MyChart. If you're not a Fred Hutch patient, uh, but are interested in a um, sarcoma survivorship visit, you can call our intake coordinators at the same phone number, 206-606-2018, and, and just let them know you're a new patient and that you're interested in a sarcoma survivorship visit. To learn more about survivorship, um, I will be showing you some slides that can take you to um, areas in the Fred Hutch uh, website where you can learn more. This QR code will take you to the Fred Hutch Survivorship Clinic webpage. There's a lot of information and resources about survivorship on this page. If you are a sarcoma patient and you'd like um, to learn more about our surveillance and survivorship, um, clinic visits, you can go to our uh, website through this um, QR code. The Nutrition Services um, website um, is here and you can um, watch some other videos from the nutrition uh, providers and learn more about what they offer with the nutrition consultations. Thank you. All right, so that was our last talk. Um, since it was recorded, we won't have Jenny here to answer questions, but we are able to answer questions now. So it looks like Dr. Loggers is actually still on, as is Dr. Hunter uh, and Karen Cook. So, and of course, Dr. Schaub and I, and we are happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, just put them in the chat and, uh, Dr. Shelb and I will try and uh, keep an eye on what's coming in. Um, I, a little bit a while ago, I tried to delete some of the questions that we had already answered. Um, I'm just going to go back and sort of take things as I see them. So going all the way back, so there's one question that is, are undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcomas the same as undifferentiated small round cell sarcomas? And I guess the short answer to that is no. Um, and I think that highlights the importance of having a sarcoma specialist pathologist actually review the sample because uh, they would do extra testing and try and actually differentiate uh, the various things that they see to see, can they really pin down a name on that type of sarcoma. Um, and then there's another question. Do you think IA can help you in any way? Um, I'm not sure what IA is. I'm wondering I if it's AI. it's AI. Yeah, AI, so artificial intelligence. So excellent question. I think that's sort of a hot area for research, but right now it's still, I would say, considered research. So. Um, I think in the future, we might actually use AI, especially for things like image recognition. Um, but right now, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, I can say in radiation oncology, we are um, rolling out different AI platforms for essentially having the AI delineate a lot of the normal tissues in the body for our patients, such as the bladder or the kidney or the lungs or those type of things, just to save time on, and 
kind of harness the computer's ability to distinguish it with physician approval. So it has a long way to go for the subtle findings that takes into creating a radiation plan for a patient with sarcoma, but we are gonna see emergence of AI, I think really helping augment at every different field. And so that it allows us to be able to even be more present and have more time for patients. So that's what I'm excited about. Yeah. And then there's another question. Can you help a patient getting uh, or to get a medicine that's denied by insurance? And I would sort of even expand that question to say really any service that's denied by insurance. And the answer is yes, although we can't guarantee that will be able to overturn that denial, but we can certainly try where really anytime there's something that's denied, there's always a procedure to appeal that denial. And in many cases, actually, especially for sarcomas, just because they're such rare tumors and so few things are actually specifically approved for treatment of sarcoma, even though we use them, sometimes insurance company denials are actually even expected. So, um, you know, always feel free to discuss that with your treating team. Uh, so if it's a medicine, then certainly with your oncologist, or if it's, for example, something like protons, then talk to the radiation oncology team and they can talk to you about potentially appealing those decisions. Unfortunately, sometimes even the appeals are unsuccessful and it can take a good amount of time um, but it is something that at least can be done. And in many cases, we will uh, eventually have those denials be overturned and be able to use whatever uh, that particular treatment is. So I can take the next one. Um, so I mentioned at the end of my talk, a more pinpoint form of radiation therapy. And I'll type in um, for all the participants at the end, the acronym is SBRT or Stereotactic Body Radiation Therapy. And that's essentially very high dose radiation therapy that is typically delivered um, to smaller tumors in locations that are often further away from kind of other, other structures or organs that cannot tolerate that very, very high ablative dose of radiation that we deliver in as few as three to five treatments. Um, the most common type of situation that we use this for are for tumor sarcoma tumors that have spread to the lung. Typically when they are smaller, um, usually somewhere less than one to three centimeters and often when they're not touching one of the, um, not touching, for example, the swallowing tube esophagus or some of the very nearby airways. Um, other times which we sometimes use it for is tumors that have spread to the liver um, on certain other parts in the body. Um, so we definitely do take that into account when we're looking at um, what type of radiation might be best. It can be nice because it tends to have very good low control rates in the long run, tends to, from a patient perspective, it's just few treatments, which is nice, and the side effects in general um, that patients typically experience are quite mild. There can be sometimes a list of long-term potential low, low incident side effects that we always review based on that specific scenario. Um, but I'll go ahead and put that acronym um, into the chat. Dr. Wagner, you're Sorry, Yep, just noted. So again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. I think we actually answered most of them. There are a few that are sort of more specific to certain people's specific sort of situations. And I really would encourage you to bring those questions to your treatment team. I'm sure I mean, we're just trying to keep things somewhat anonymous as much as we can here. And also, uh, I think any medical advice should really be limited to the treatment team. All right, so there's a question, would patients with no evidence of disease 
but on lifelong maintenance therapy benefit from the survivorship clinic? And I would say yes, probably, potentially. Um, so uh, certainly talk to your treatment team if that would be appropriate. It uh, sounds like it certainly could be. And um, as long as they agree that it sounds like that survivorship clinic as it would be appropriate, then we can help set up that appointment. All right, and there's actually a number of people posting questions about just the availability of the talks and the slides. So we will send out a link with the recording of the slides and we'll try and gather at least as many of the presentations themselves for those of you who uh, would like a copy of the slides. I, I'm not sure if we'll be able to get all of them, but uh, we'll send out what we can collect. But certainly these uh, talks have all been recorded, and we will send you the link for how to access that. Um, and then also just another reminder, there is a link that Ritu uh, posted into the chat for feedback. Uh, we definitely want to hear what your thoughts are and how we can improve for the next time. Absolutely. This is for you, and so we just want to figure out how we can better help. And there's a, a question, how can we copy the chat? I don't think we can, but we can at least put in the relevant or most relevant links that have been included, like, for example, for the Northwest Sarcoma Foundation, for the Sarcoma Foundation of America, uh, and make sure that those are included and along with the survey. So those will be included in the email. All right, so I guess this is our last call for questions. All right, well, I'll let Dr. Schaub have the final word. All right, well, thank you, everyone. And I will let you, I work in a radiation oncology building, we have no windows, so I will let you all enjoy your day and I hope the sun will be coming out. I'm not 100% sure. And Thank you. please have a low threshold though um, for some of those questions that did come in to ask any of us on your clinical team, should a, should a referral be helpful to those different teams that you got introduced today and heard about and we're always happy to work with you to figure it out. Thank you. All right, and thank you to all of our speakers. Appreciate your time. All right, have a good weekend.